your socket. Um, um, so we have a packed two and a half hour session for you all today um, about state channels. Um, there's seven teams talking today, uh, all of whom have got various levels of expertise in various parts of the uh, puzzle. Um, it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, so um, I, Jeremy Longley from Funfair, we've been uh, working on state channels for uh, nearly three years now. It's a core technology in our particular application. And, um, um, and we've uh, been working closely with the other teams over the last, uh, over the last sort of more, more recent times um, to try and um, bring some standardisation to this process. We have, uh, I think, hopefully, if I've got all of this right, this is what we've got out today. Um, uh, so that's got our four magnum, uh, next cell, and uh, finally ready to, uh, to, to wrap things up for us. Um, Certainly, the, uh, the, like, all of the, the top sets have joined the State Challenge group with a commitment to producing uh, standardization across, um, uh, across the teams. We've all over the years developed kind of the technology independently, and we're coming together to try and produce some standards so that it will be easier to develop uh, words and UI and other companion applications and technologies such as things um, we're doing with Watchtower with Guardian. Um, and we're really very much looking forward to seeing how that sort of comes together um, over the next few months. Um, so I'm just going to give you sort of a quick oversight and overview and introduction um, to, to, to state channels. Um, I'm guessing it's most of these heard of the day um, uh, before we dive in. Um, so um, you could express this in a number of different ways, but I've written here that state channels are a combination of protocols and techniques that allow two or more participants to execute a sequence of complex transactions between each other off-chain while retaining the security properties of the underlying blockchain. So it's a layer 2 solution. What the fundamental, what the fundamental means is that with Ethereum, we have this, uh, this, the security properties of the chain. We know how it works. We know uh, why it works. It's a decentralized nature and, and the cryptography underneath it. But we can use a sequence of techniques that mean that we don't have to really to, um, pay for gas and wait for transactions to Mind in order to get a, a, a smooth process flow between, between individuals. Um, in, 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 this is a general explanation, there are variations on this. This is generally true for all more participants. You generally commit, before you start a state channel, you commit some funds on the chain, uh, along with any particular properties of what it is that you want this, this, this uh, state channel to be about, or any rules of that channel, um, and the initial state of the channel. And then participants interact directly with each other off-chain, um, advancing the state of the site of the channel via the choices that they make, um, uh, following the rules of the channel, and signing commitments as they proceed. And once the final outcome of the channel is, is determined and agreed by the participants, an on-chain transaction is made again. This releases the funds um, uh, according to the outcome of the, the state of the state channel. Um, so the, the kind of simplest working example of a, of a state channel with just two <coughs> participants just sending funds to and from each other. This oh, animation. Um, this is just um, this is not what it's like. Um, so we've got two two participants out of both here, um, um, and they commit some funds into a contract on chain, like a adjudicated contract in this case. And we have an initial state where they both have five, um, and then if they make it, if uh, Bob sends. Uh, one to Alice, and Alice has six, and Bob has four. And then if, if um, Alice sends four to Bob, it goes seven, three and seven, etc. These are a series of transactions that the people are making and signing. So we end up with a final state with the, with the way that the funds are distributed. Um, that goes back onto the chain, it is mined, and the funds are distributed accordingly. So, this, so in this case, the state of the channel is just the, the record of who has this. Which funds? So really, in order to perform more complex interactions, we need a state machine. So the state machine is a, uh, a term that's been around in computer science for, for, for years, and it pretty much defines what we can do in a state channel. So, so I've always used this definition, and there are variants, but they come down to the same thing. So a state machine is a function, or code that implements the function in advanced state. It takes a state which represents where we are in the world, it, it takes an action on that state, which might transfer something, or press a button in a video game, or you know, whatever it might be, and it produces a new state. So it's a linear process 
of advancing <coughs> through states. Um, and the, the, the function is also deterministic and it has no side effects. So by deterministic I mean that if you, every time you apply this action to this state, you get the same new state. This is a vital important concept in state channel, as you'll see later when we talk about security. Um, and there's no side effect means that everything you need to run a state, to run a state machine is in the state. Um, it's, um, it's entirely self-contained. Um, and any application that can be coded using this technique is a candidate for state change. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about a, a, an example of this over the first sort of few, few talks. Um, so we picked um, one of ours. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, I will talk over this video. This is, this is um, just an example of, of, of a state channel sort of actually working from a user experience point of view. So choosing how much this is the properties of the channel. So I'm choosing how much funds to open the channel with. I'm signing a transaction and that transaction is uh, sent to the chain. Um, um, so while well, this, this is a video, I know this bit takes ages. So, so um, behind the scenes here, the other, count, the other counterparty, which is the, the house in our, uh, in our casino example, has also signed a, a transaction. It's also committing funds to the chain. And so this is the, the, the setup phase. Protestants are living very badly when this happens, so let's see if I can skip on a little bit. Um, right, and so when the chain is open, when the chain is open, we have the ability to play our game, which is advancing state. So we can make, we, the, as, a, as a player in this case, we can make a sequence of bets. Um, and the, there's a random number of process here, which we'll talk about in a bit, which, which determines the outcome of the winnings. And each time the, the ball is spin, you could, on down in this corner, you can see these are the balances of the player and the house of the two people in the channel. And these balances change as the as the um, as the game progresses. So, um, so each of these, uh, if we try and that is an alien and the ball is spun, represents a state transition. Um, and uh, and uh, then we'll talk about a bit more about that. Um, and then when we get to the end of this, this is just some stuff verifying this contract. Um, we will. Uh, want to close the channel, so so you so sign a transaction, which is what this is going on standing behind the scenes here. You sign a transaction that says the end of the state, the end of the channel is agreed by the two participants. I have this balance, and the house has this balance, and that transaction is marked on the chain. Um, and so, um, in order to look at this work example, we need to do a lot of things. This is what first half of the session is going to be about. We need to implement the rules of this game in the state machine. Um, we need to establish a protocol for orderly state transition as the game plays out. Uh, we need to uh, implement security against um, bad actors or missing actors, actors of people who stop participating in the channel. We need to talk about how channels are funded and how you get the funding out at the end of that. And then we're going to talk Bit about um, about user interface design, um, and um, that's uh, pretty much uh, the introduction to this. So I'm going to hand over to to Liv from L4, who's going to start uh, working our way through this. So this is specifically the state progression protocol and how you move state uh, forward. And we're going to go through the example of roulette. Uh, but before we do the roulette example, I'm going to explain the abstract what is within the state. So uh, let's dive into that. Um, I'm just going to set a timer for myself so I know what to So, uh, so what does the state contain? And again, if there's questions, like please, like shout them out because uh, this is like it took a long time to get to the point where this was all agreed upon. And uh, if there's anything misunderstood, it's very useful to clarify. So, what is in the state? Uh, in English, this is exactly everything. So it's a pretty comprehensive list I'm going to go through. And they're pretty self-explanatory, but I'll go through them. So obviously, 
in every state object, you need to know who's involved. And the reason why is because this is a fixed um, set of people, you know, Amps and protocol. You need to know that, and so it's in the state, the list of addresses. Two is the chain identifier. Is this main? Is it Robson? Is it Ringby? What is this? Is it like, is it EOS? Whatever it is. You need to know what the chain identifier is. Um, three is a unique identifier for this particular channel. Uh, so that's just basically one number for all the channels you ever use as a client. You keep track of that. Uh, fourth is the challenge period. So if you if you need to go to the chain, you want to know how long are we going to wait. So again, this is small, this is per state. You keep track of this. The latest version number, obviously, because this is state channel. You need to keep track of each time you're implementing the version number. And again, these are this is somewhat obvious, but it's uh, it's important to know this is in every state object. You'll see one in a bit. Um, the would-be outcome of the state. This one's a bit more nuanced if, if you're not familiar with state channels. Every single time you update the state of your channel for all channels, you keep track of if this state was the last state ever. You know, for example, in the roulette game, you'll see you'll see some examples of this. If it just ended there, you need to know who gets which money, right? Um, is it a final state? In state channels, the notion of like, are we are we done for sure? And if everyone signs off on a bunch of final states, which I'll show you can know that you do not need a challenge period because there's a notion of finality. You're not going to progress further from this particular state. You sign off on that. Um, the definition of the state machine, which Jeremy just described as a necessary and important part of state channels. What exactly defines how you move from one state to the other? And the, the application specific state data. Obviously, like a state machine only makes sense if you're passing in data to, to move through with. And then the most obvious piece is the signature of the turn taker. Now, normally, maybe in state channels, you're familiar with like you sign each state update with everybody. But we're going to describe how actually that, that can be a bit more simplified. And for each individual state, you just need one signature to move it forward. So that's in English. Uh, yep, yeah, question. So it seems like some of these uh, are initialized when the channel's created and then they never change. But then other ones of them are. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I'll show, you, I'll show you exactly that in a second. Um, so this is that, what I just described, but with solidity types, okay? So like, it's pretty self-explanatory. Some of these are addressed you know, in some numbers and they're dynamic data types. And you can see, to your question, that some are fixed, some are dynamic. The fixed parts that is in the entire iteration of the state channel game. So on a roulette example, you'll see all this. The same people, the same blockchain, the same unique identifier for this channel, the same channel duration. I'm gonna, you could make this an app, but it's simpler it's kept static. And the same state machine, which is what we call the app definition. And you'll see why it's an app definition. Variable is a turn number. It goes up. The outcome changes based on the situation that you're at in the game. The app data obviously changes because you're progressing the state. Because it's final changes because you might get to the end. And the signature changes because each time you get a new signature. So this is very specific, but it's important to keep in mind all these properties as we explain. So some, some things to keep in mind. Each individual state has a mover. And so here you can see an example of how state is progressed between kind of two people, this is a house, Bob situation here. One goes, then the other goes, then one goes, then the other goes, then one goes, then the other goes. And it's always in order. It's not one, it's not, it's not A, B, C, A, B, A, B, A, B. It's, it's always A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. It's cyclical in that sense. Um, and again, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Fundamentally, it's because this is a unanimous consent protocol. You need to be able to account for the fact that every single person is involved in this protocol and has to be consensual to state updates. Uh, where, and where not, where that not to be the case, then one can be the other, and you can enter into a weird situation. Since it's fundamentally unanimous consent, you want to move through each person for simplicity. And so, we have this concept of a mover. The mover is pretty straightforwardly. It's the it's the it's the person in the participants list who is turned them. Turn, um, for its nonce is module the length of the list. So in two, it's pretty straightforward. It's zero one zero one zero one zero one. Um, so uh, obviously, the person whose turn it is has to sign the state. That should be fairly straightforward. You can't have Alice signing a state where it's meant to be Bob. Which means if Alice is signing some state, sending sending it to Bob, if that is the latest known state, it's expected that Bob is going to reply. And that's a very important property. You want to know if any way you can assert that someone is at fault by not responding, that is very useful for writing the on-chain logic to be as simple as possible. Um, and another property is that with the, his final modifier, anyone can exit at any time. 
if at any time I choose I'm done, I can say that this is final for me. If the rest of the participants sign off with their turn saying it's also final, it's over. So this is not always something you want to do. Usually it's going to be not in your favor to just end abruptly. For example, and you'll see in the roulette, if you will, if you want to end abruptly when you're when you're expected to be making a move, such as like you know, rolling on the on the machine, then you're basically what you're doing is you're boarding. Usually this is a quick property, but it's a useful property because you do not want to have your money locked up. So the main point being made here is that you should want to be able to you should be able to exit at any point in time if you choose, such that your money's not locked. But probably you're going to be losing out because usually it's a forfeit operation. In a payment channel example, it's more simple because you can end the payment channel at any time. And so declaring as final is saying, I'm done with the channel. Um, and then some of the, some of the, kind of the core uh, state channel transition logic is operated on by this valid transition function. The way that state is considered to be valid, uh, validly progressed is that the valid transition between any two uh, uh, function returns true. So you take two states, S1, S2, it should be true. S2, S3, it should be true. And the most basic possible example I can write on the slide is a counter. In a counter, this application would be, there's a number, the next logical state is that number plus one. Okay, so here you can see the most basic you know, statement, which is the state machine. Uh, you want the S2 counter to be S1 counter plus one. If it's not, it'll, obviously this will, so error will not be a true uh, outcome. And so that is function is returned. Yeah, no question. So Jeremy was talking about advanced state. Is there a difference between the advanced state and the valid transition? Yeah, so this, this is a nuance we want to be, I can explain it now, but it's a nuance that wanna, we didn't want to put you on the slides, but um, basically, I'll say this as clear as I can. Valid transition is a function which defines that if you have two states, if you run valid transition on them, it should be certain true. Advanced state is, from the way we look at it, more of a functional interface on top of this function. And you can think of it as, if I have some state, and I want to advance it with an action. So let's say for tic tac toe, I have tic tac toe board, and I want to place the X on the tic tac toe board. Then the result is the tic tac toe board now with the X on it. So we have three things: we have the previous board, we have the action, we have the new board. You can have, you can write a function file transition which says take the hash of the previous of the um, of the sorry of the new state with the X on the board. That's variable one. And then run, apply an advanced state for the old board and the action, and you get the output from that function, and compare, is the hash of that equal to the hash of the new state being proposed, which is S2 in this case. So if the hash of basically the second state is equal to the advanced state of S1 plus an action, that is a valid transition. So this is just a slightly higher level abstraction, which allows for that type of application to be built, and also for this kind of application to be built. Um, and since we're not, this is more about the standard of the state progression protocol and not necessarily standards for how you write applications from a developer point of view, or maybe that's a bit simpler to think about. I showed you this slide. Because this can be non-deterministic, right? Um, uh, so there's one thing I didn't, well actually it can't be, because it's, it's pure. And so, so it, it's, 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 it actually is deterministic based on the state. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Let's just, so you don't have access to the action, so essentially you have to be able to tell that it's a valid transition without knowing the... Yeah, so like I mentioned in that, that and for this, <coughs> yes. However, like in, that thing I mentioned, you, you can write on top of this, generalized right. person, then you do have access to that. Okay. That's, that's more of a way of describing this. For example, I think like arbitrary could be defined in, in, in terms of that. I, I was just thinking in general, essentially, like if, um, if it was hard to, like if the state transition was complicated, then essentially, Potentially, without the action, it might be hard to actually like calculate whether or not S2 yeah. properly came from S1. Yeah, I always put the action in the state of right. Yeah, right. So yeah. that would be just like how you define yeah. these things. Yeah, yeah. that's that's why I recommend it for application building purposes mm -hmm. for, for the raw protocol definition. I think this yeah. is a simple abstraction. Um, so that's my part of the talk. Um, Tom is going to describe that description in the context of it. Okay, thanks again. Um, so what Liam has just explained, I guess, is um, the structure of these states that are going to form the state channel. And 
what I'm going to start off by talking about is how you actually write an application that runs in this format. And the application that we're going to focus on is based on the roulette application that Jeremy introduced. Um, but we're going to simplify it slightly for the purposes of this talk. Um, so what we're going to look at is this example which we're calling Red Black Roulette. And Red Black Roulette is basically just roulette, but you can only choose the red numbers or the black numbers. Um, so if I just run through how this works, each player either picks red or black. And I say each player, we're looking at a two-player scenario where that's, that's confusing. What we've got a player and a house. So it's the two participants day channel here that we're focusing on. One participant's the player, the other the player the participants the house. So the player picks either red or black. The house then decides and an, and an amount to wager on, on that colour. Um, the house decides whether to accept the bet or not. Um, the roulette wheel is then spun and it generates a random number between 0 and 36. Um, and the player wins if they chose red and it's even and not 0, or if they chose black and the number is odd. Um, so the interesting thing here is going to be that or third point where the roulette wheel is spun and it generates a random number between 0 and 36. Um, and we're going to be looking at how you actually do that in a state channel. And um, as a spoiler, the answer is you do a commit reveal scheme, which probably is familiar with, but I'll explain a bit on the next slide. Um, so in order to write this in a state channel, we have to break this process down into a series of different states um, and define which transitions are allowed between those states. Um, so in the case of roulette, we're going to end up with this state machine here. So we start in the top left hand corner in the start state. And the start state just stores the balances of the house and the player. So when they like enter into the state channel, they're going to land in that state. And those amounts should match the amounts that they've um, deposited into the channel, as we'll see a little bit later. Um, the next step is the propose step. So this is the thing that the player, so like, as, as Liam said, these players take turns. So we're going to start at the start. Propose is going to be the thing that the player does. The house is going to respond to accept. The player is going to respond to the reveal. And then we're going to go round and round, taking turns in these states. So to start kick off the game, the player formulates this propose step. And in doing that, the propose step has balances. If they include the wager, in this case, um, the player wants to wager two. Um, they choose their color, and then they commit to a random number. And they commit to a random number by providing a hash of the number they've cho chosen, in this case, four, and some secret value. And that's the thing they take they into the state and they send that over to the house. And now the house takes a look at that, they're like, am I happy to accept this bet? Um, they decide yes, and so then they reply with this other state, so they take everything that is in the proposed state, and to that they add their random number. So we're actually doing a one-side commit reveal, but that's fine. So like, at this point, the house is, they, they, they just like pick their random number, um, and then they send that back to the player. Now the player at this point knows whether they've won or not. They can see the house's random number, they know what their random number was, and their next action is to reveal um, this state. So the reveal state has the final full position. So like to calculate that full position, they add together those two random numbers, um, modulo 36, 37, 36, 37. 37. <laughs> um, to generate that random number between 0 and 36. Um, and um, then they, have to, they reveal their salt um, that they use to hash their random number so that the house can verify that they're not cheating, um, that the number that they're using is the number they've been committed to, and they calculate the winner, and then they update the totals appropriately. And then they can continue round this thing as many rounds as they want to do. Um, so these are the different states, and this is how we're going to model this, this like, roulette game in our state channel. Um, so when we're actually writing the state channel contract, uh, we need to encode these states, and we also need to encode the valid transition rules between these states. So if the if you start in the start state, what are the possible values 
post date that the player can craft. Because obviously not all of them. We have to be quite specific about which which states are okay. So what I'm going to do quickly now is just go through for each of these transitions what the rules are. And I expect you can probably start guessing in your head what these rules are going to be. Um, so the first rule here is the house balance can't change. So we can't have the player like formulating a, a bet and suddenly like taking all the house's money. Similarly, player balance can't change. This is kind of like basic stuff. Um, the wager has to be smaller than or equal to the house balance. And the wager has to be smaller than or equal to the player balance. Um, choice has to be red or black. And that's it. So these are just like pretty much like data validation things. Um, this would have to be coded up into a smart contract to check the two things about it. You have to put a smart contract, or you can assume the house will not sign, then it's not in very anyway. Um, it has to be coded into a smart contract, and the reason it has to be coded into a smart contract is if we end up having to dispute a step on chain. The chain needs to be able to check, you know, like, we'll come to this later, uh -huh. but like, um, one of the things, one of the problems, about the going to cover this later, but I'll just like, just keep with you. One of the problems with state channels is if one player stops responding, and that's the thing that you really need to get the chain involved, and you have to be able to say, you know, like, you're not responding, I'm going to challenge you on chain by the next state, and, it's, and the chain has to be able to check whether the state you've provided is a valid transition. So these rules do need to be coded into a smart contract, and this is like the bespoke part in each different app that you're writing. Um, uh, okay, the next one is a proposal, just begins to get a little bit more interesting. Um, so, in this step, um, we update the balances, um, and again, we're going to explain why you update the balances like this later. But as a quick sneak preview, it's basically because you're thinking what happens if the player doesn't respond as the next step. You know, who, basically, if the player doesn't respond to the next step, you know, never mind, let's deal with that later. Um, so these balances have to have to update like this. That's the interesting part, and then there's some bookkeeping stuff like the way you should change. The choice shouldn't change. You can't have the, you can't have the house changing the player's bet, um, and the random commit should change. Um, the next one is the accept the reveal. This is where like most of the logic of the actual application is. Um, so um, to make sure that this step is valid, we need to make sure that the player has calculated the joint random number correctly, and in doing that, they've used the value that they've pre-committed to. Um, and that's what this does, basically. So if you look at, we're calculating what was the, what was the um, player's random number by the difference of the wall position and the house of random number. And then we're checking that when you hash that with the salt that was provided, you get this, this random value from the last thing. Um, and the other thing is that you have to have calculated the winner correctly. Now, that's just that, that those rules that I created up there, describing words earlier about like if it's red and even and not green and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we also need to make sure that we update the house balance and the player balance correctly. So in this case, um, you can see that the player has won and that there's a mistake that um, like the balance is probably set wrong. Um, and then finally going from reveal back to the start, um, we just need to make sure balances the same. Okay, so what I guess what I've just described there is the game specific parts of writing roulette as a state channel application. Um, combined with that are the framework parts, which are some of the stuff that Liam alluded to. Um, so um, but, um, um, so here is the state. Um, what I'm showing you here is how we actually take that like, game specific part and put it into the state channel framework. So this is the state that Liam introduced, um, and this is how it maps on to that start state that I showed you in the game. So we've taken that like game specific stuff and we've put it into a load of framework stuff. 
So we've added things like participants, the addresses, the assigning addresses of the participants stored in an array. We've got the chain ID, the channel nonce. The channel nonce is picked by the players to make sure that the channel ID <coughs> is unique. And we'll, I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, but this app definition, by writing red and black roulette there, I mean the address of the on-chain smart contract of code up the rules that I explained to you in the previous slides. Um, turn number is starting at zero. Um, this is the first stage of the thing. The outcome is um, what people would get if the channel stopped in this position. Um, that's the house balance and the player balance from the state. Um, just see. And then we've got, it's not final and um, signature. Um, so the actual, so we've got like the game state and the game rules, and that's put inside the framework state, which has this extra stuff. And there are also some framework rules which define the, um, how these states are allowed to update. So the framework rules cover things like participants can't change, the chain ID can't change, the turn number must increment, and so on. Um, and I don't think we're actually going to go over those in these talks, but you can find those. Um, I can find out more about that if you're interested. Um, okay. So this is how we construct the initial state, and this is what player one, the player would actually craft um, in their software. Um, and they also calculate a channel ID. So the channel ID is calculated by hashing together the participants and the channel nonce and the chain ID. So that's how we like identify this channel, and that's going to be important when we start depositing money on the chain for the purposes of this channel. Um, this is going to be like the channel's identifier. Um, and we're just going to call that R123, but in fact that's going to be a bytes32 um, value that's going to uniquely identify that channel. And it's on the participants to make sure that that is unique. So together they can make sure that that channel logs, they can change that channel logs to make sure that they never get a repeat of the channel ID. Um, and they should, they, that's one of the things that they have to take on. They should never enter into a channel with a duplicate channel ID. Do you enforce the all the same participants in the channel number must be unique? the participants. So the select the wording yeah. is this on the purely on the off chain uh, yeah. off chain code. It's on but you, not on not on chain. It's on you as a participant to make sure that you don't enter into another channel with the same ID. So the burden, like in addition to all the other option stuff I have to remember, I also need to make kind of a copy of all the nonce I've used with the same players. It's enough to store the highest nonce that you've used for each With the same always. Yeah. Okay. You can also do things like, you can get around this by the, the address at the top, or it can be ephemeral addresses. So it might mean that your software just generates a brand new address for you in every channel you enter into, and that's another way of meeting this requirement. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can do it randomly or you can do it by storing the highest nonce so far for each one. Just want to confirm the on chain does not care. So it's actually what would be possible yeah. to see kind of like a re entry of the, of the channel. Yeah, so like a lot of these channels, a lot of these channel IDs, the chain will never know anything about because they're mm -hmm. right. So like the chain really can't keep track of that for you. Mm -hmm. You have to do it. Um, Okay, and then for the purpose of this talk, we're going to hide some unimportant fields. So I'm basically going to hide a lot of the stuff that just stays the same. Um, and so this is what I'm actually going to be looking at. And what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to go through state by state how an interaction in this state channel would actually work with all the updates in this format. Um, all right. Okay, so this is the... This is the first state we start with. And the player formulates the state. You can see it's got like the start state in there um, and sent it to the house. Um, and the house is going to um, formulate its next state and send it back. And what the players are doing here is they're doing an opening handshake. So we're doing this round where they're doing, we call this the pre-fund setup round. And it's making sure that both players have a state that's signed by both of them before they put any money on the chain. And that's important in order to keep the players safe. It's basically their key to releasing that money if something goes wrong. Um, so both parties now hold two signed states, one with each of their signature on. Um, 
we call this as the court proof for state one. It's like something you can find the chain to show that both players like agreed he got to state one. It's like a, it's, it, I guess the format is like signature of player one, valid transition, signature of player two. So they've got like two states joined, joined together with two signatures on them. That's like a, something you can do to prove the chain to say that like we agreed we got to this state. Um, uh, why do we both? To check the turn number, the higher wins to the middle. Yes, um, you need both. I mean, if, if um, you need both because each one is only signed by one participant. So in general, to prove that I got to a point, I need signatures from all the participants involved. Otherwise, if I could do it unilaterally, I could just like be like, I'm going to create state 10, then that to the chain, and then and I could do that without any involvement. It, it basically, the reason is because we do this turn taking stuff mm -hmm. as a consequence of that. If you're going to sign, if each person is going to sign one state, you, you need two signatures, and that means you need two states. We do actually have an optimization where you don't need that, but don't mm -hmm. get into that. Does that make sense? But after you send your sign card, um, say, say the, the party that sends the turn number one, that he has no uh, confirmation that the other party received this. Uh, um, yeah, so and let's say that's uh, Alice and Bob. Alice sends zero to Bob. Yeah. Bob sees uh, Alice one seat and then co sign back. Yeah. Then Bob will send a new uh, turn number one to Alice. Okay, so what happens is Alice sends zero to Bob uh -huh. and then Bob sends one to Alice. Oh. At that point, Alice has zero and one and Bob has zero and one. And when they both have zero and one, then it's safe for them to deposit on chain, as was the case. So here I'm going to introduce the adjudicator, um, which is the on-chain contract, which is going to hold the funds for the duration of the channel. And it is also going to be responsible for enforcing the rules if there's a challenge, if we end up in a dispute situation, um, which the going to cover in a bit. Um, so at the moment, we're going to have the adjudicator, you can just think of it, like in, in actual fact, the adjudicator is a suite of a number of contracts, but I'm just going to consider it to be this, this one contract. And it's going to have addresses, so that's going to be addresses for channels, balances, and outcomes. So um, now they both hold <coughs> these two states, they can then deposit. So the player, the player is going to deposit first, because they have the first participant. Um, so they call this deposit method, and into the adjudicator you get the channel ID and an amount stored next to it. Um, and then the house deposits, and you end up with channel ID and 10 stored next to it. The ordering there is important. The ordering there has to match the ordering of the participants, and the reason it has to match that is because that's the order they get the money out in. So like if you ended if, if the channel is only partially funded, the first player is going to have um, precedence in getting the money out first, which is why they put the money in first. Um, that should become a bit clearer of stuff that they need to do. Okay. Um, so once they see the coins in the adjudicator, they can then proceed with the off with the um, exchange in states. So we've done this pre-fund setup, done deposit. We're now going to have a post-fund setup stage. And this is again part of the framework transition rules. And that is to, for both participants to like acknowledge that they know that this channel is now funded. They both see the money on the chain. Um, so again, they're just going to echo the same state back and forth. So they've now basically got four copies of this like start state um, with increasing turn numbers. The first two of them being the pre-fund setup, the last two being the post-fund setup. And now we're in a position where all the participants agreed that we would open the channel, we would fund the channel, and now we can actually start running the algorithm, which is what happens next. Um, so these are the next states when you start running the algorithm. Here we are actually, you can see that the app data has expanded, and inside the app data, we've got those states that I had in the state machine. So you can see that we've got a proposed, a major choice, and a random commit. So that is the proposed state, and the house just gone to this, this accept state, and then a random number. Um, we then do the next state, so we do the reveal state. Again, it's all packed into the app data, and we 
finally finish up in back in the start state. So we've done like all four states in that um, roulette state machine, and they're all packed into this like framework state that's around them. Um, suppose now the player wants to start stop playing. So what I'm showing you here is a happy case scenario the state over state channel. So like you deposit, you play, you you con conclude collaboratively. Um, so in this case, um, what happens is the player then signs the exact same state, but putting its final to true. So this is where they're, they're, they're both. What's going to happen here? Both participants going to going to like sign off on the final state. Um, so that the player signs the state with final true. House signs the state with final true. Um, they're then both holding two states with find this final true, we call that a conclusion proof. So like it's like both both um, players have signed up on this and that's evidence you can give to this chain to say we finished this channel collaboratively. So you can then take that conclusion proof, we're going to provide it to the adjudicator and the outcome from this channel is going to get printed into the adjudicator. So the final outcome for this is the player has seven has seven, three and that is that is like stored on the chain and at this point we say the channel is finalized. The outcome that we agreed off chain has been registered on chain and is the final version of that channel. Um, so this is how you do that. You call the conclude method. The conclude method checks that both of those are, are like um, final states and they're about a transition and stuff. Um, and then finally the final step is to actually get the money out of this. And the way you do that is you call the transfer. So transfer on a channel, it looks at um, what was in the adjudicator. Just leave that here. So like, we've got this final outcome. Um, transfer first pays out. First pays out to the first thing in the outcome. It sets it up to zero, and then pays out to the second person in the outcome. So it's paying out the external Ethereum addresses. So the money is now out of the contract, and we've finished our state channel interaction. Um, Liam is now going to talk about what happens when things go wrong before that question. Is there a separate batch of adjudicator contracts for each application? No. So um, the way we have it currently is that we have one adjudicator contract, which is responsible for, launch, for like going from channel ID to outcome. And then we have a suite of asset holder contracts, one for each token you want to use in the state channel. So it's like an ETH asset holder, it's an ERC20 asset holder. But it's pretty important that these things are all in the same contract um, when you get on to having like more advanced channels that fund one another, because they need to be able to send money within the contract to each other. Are there any more questions before I hand over? Great. Um, so, okay, so, great, that's how it's supposed to work. Uh, what, what can go wrong? Um, I'm only going to talk about the two most important cases. There's one subtle one I'll also talk a little bit about at the end. But these are the most important scenarios. One is the player is playing, and he's sending a state to the house. The house accepts it, and is waiting for the player to respond, and nothing happens. The just, just, software is just waiting. Um, and specifically when this matters is in this example right here, where the, the player like gambled some money on, some, on red, and uh, the house accepted the gamble, and the player now is expected to do the reveal state that we talked about earlier, and realize, like, oh shit, like, uh, I actually lost, and so they just leave. What happens in this scenario? Um, you know, like I, like I kind of said, the house is going to have its funds locked unless it does something, so what we do is we introduce the, into the adjudicator this new method called challenge. And challenge is basically a button you can push on the adjudicator, which requires that you send in, like Tom mentioned, a um, uh, basically a, a supported state that shows that the player chose this app, this choice, I accepted it, and now the guy's not responding, so force them to basically by initiating a timeout. So you pass in the last state where you know Tenber was eight, they had proposed their their state, you pass in your acceptance of it, you take them up, uh, bundle them into the contract and you push challenge, and what happens is it puts this data on state. 
It's supposed to end at 7 ETH, uh, 3 ETH at this point in my acceptance of the state, which is an important kind of subtlety there. The outcome immediately after the House accepts it at this point says the House wins. Because if that state were to be the last state ever, which is the case if the player doesn't respond to this challenge, the House should win. Because basically what, it, what that means is that if this was the last state, the player just left, which is akin to them forfeit. So we say, hey, seven three. I want my money. I accepted it, and there's a timeout now. And that's the timeout is the length of the state uh, challenge duration I mentioned earlier. And you know, this is basically what the API for that looks like. And if the guy doesn't respond after that timeout is uh, finished, you know, the number of blocks has passed more than the sum of you know, the challenge duration, then basically it's considered to be done. And in the same way that you would with a conclusion proof from what Tom just mentioned, where the outcome on the chain says, you know, 7.3, that's basically sell on chain. It's now 7.3, and the channel is done. This is what happens um, if someone just stops responding to you. You can always force them to. That's why this whole thing is called force move protocol, because if anything at any point in time goes wrong, you can push this, this button and uh, force your counterparty to make their, take their turn. So they're forced to pay as if they were doing a bet without any red or black option. Um, they're forced to respond in some way. They have five each. They both, yeah, they both put five each in, and in the the states, in this, uh, when when the house accepted the bet that the player made, the outcome was changed to be the such the house won at this point. The house accepted the bet. I now get the money, and if the player provides a reveal state after this that is the one that calculates that they were the winner based on that function that we mentioned, then it would change to be that the player won in the next state. However, you know, ultimately, maybe the house won, um, and the test gets, it would be the same as this situation. So that's basically what happens here, is you, you force them to make that move. And the only log with is something that passes the valid tradition test that we talked about. So it, you're forcing the state machine forward. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, however, there's like a, another version of this where maybe the player just like was gone for a little while and they weren't actually trying to not, you know, not respond because they thought they lost. Maybe they actually did win. They just like closed their laptop for like 20 minutes or something like that. Lost cell phone signal. Yeah, they lost cell phone signal or something like this. Like basically, they should be able to respond, right? That's why we have a timeout. And so, pretty straightforwardly, you can imagine this state exists, which is the one I, just, I mentioned a second ago. Um, actually, I swapped the 7 and 3, I didn't do it consistently. In, in this case, the player gets the 7 because they revealed, and in fact, they, they did choose a good number. They chose red, it was red. Um, and the most they should be able to do is take that, go to the adjudicator, and respond. So we introduce a new button called respond. You just pass in that latest state that you signed, which is a logical transition based on all the rules, and then you'll be able to see that the challenge basically gets erased and they can, they can keep moving forward in this case. You can just keep playing the game off chain uh, until something else happens. Maybe they decide to conclude, maybe there's another challenge scenario, whatever ends up happening. The point is, like, they weren't malicious, they came back, everything's okay. And the chain uh, allowed for this to be safe. So those are like, that's like 99.999% of the failure cases. Um, the only other failure case, which I, I didn't put slides so I'll just super quickly explain, is, you know, maybe it's some, maybe the player decides to put some super old state, like way at the beginning when they were back at 5.5. Five. Um, then what you can also do is, is the third button is checkpoint and pass in the future state that's way in the future, a turn of 10 or whatever, and it'll effectively slash the player because that's the most obvious case of them trying to cheat. But that's the more edge case software error situation, so that's why I don't want to explain too much of the slides. These are the 99.99% cases of actual on-chain operations you need to do with the channel. So that's the response function. That's it. So um, yeah, maybe we see a couple questions. I think we have like two or three minutes. So um, yeah, any questions? Does the, uh, do they have an incentive to respond if they've lost, but they want to keep their reputation as having uptime or something to play? Um, they, I mean, like, I mean, if they don't respond, then basically then as an on-chain artifact saying like, at some point, they were expected to respond and they didn't. So if you weren't, if you were keeping track of your reputation, then you probably would take that into account. Uh, so they wouldn't necessarily just get a call for an on-chain. Is it kind of hard though, because it's a non-attributable fault? You know, like, 
you don't know if it's a challenge on chain, whether I didn't respond to you or whether I responded to you and you ignored it and launched a challenge on chain anyway. So one thing you could do is you don't have to make the numbers all line up exactly. Like you could make it that you lose a little bit more if you don't respond than if you respond saying you lost. And then there's always at least some incentive to respond. Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of ways you can optimize like the outcome distribution based on scenarios. This is like the most basic uh, cases. Yeah. Yeah, for that challenge, uh, are you settling on chain or those uh, funds locked in the state channel for forever to lose response? So, um, I guess what happens, so if you launch this challenge and the person doesn't respond, then that channel becomes finalized on chain. And at that point, it's unidentifiable from if you've concluded it. All it means is that you have your channel ID and your outcome in the adjudicator. So at that point, you just transfer out your funds, just like we did in the example where we concluded it um, collaboratively on chain. So like in the happy case, yeah, basically we've got to exactly the same situation you did in the happy case, where we have channel ID, outcome on chain, and then we can release the funds. You know, if, if a player doesn't respond, can you automatically release the funds from the state channel to the region? Yes. So if a player doesn't respond, you wait the timeout. So if a player doesn't respond, you wait this timeout. After that timeout is finished, you're then in exactly the same situation in that the channel is finalized on chain, you've got channel and outcome registered in the adjudicator and then you can use that to transfer the funds out. Um, I think we're one minute over now, so I want to make sure we don't go too far. Yeah, okay. Can we do one more question? We can do one more question. Okay, one more question. Okay, one, one more question. Uh, how, do, how does the contract know the time is up? Like, does the house need to send another transaction to say, like, hey, you missed the challenge period? No, it's like, um, like it's basically like, um, when you, when you actually want to interact with this, like it, it's not literally the chain does not actually literally say like hey the time is done like the check mark alludes to. It's more so the next time you interact with it, there's a check which checks so the time up then I would it. Um, effectively, that's kind of what happens. It's, you don't really need necessarily to have a check like a boolean flag saying time is up because you can you can see like it was a challenge and the block number is clearly greater than that. So you don't really need to register that check mark. So, so put it another way, you just watch client side and then you just go to withdraw. Because you know that the time is up and then when you go to withdraw it checks and says, yeah, the time was up. So it kind of lazy evaluates it. So as the house, I would submit to end the state channel to get my money back. Right, because you want to withdraw the money anyways. Right. So you just say, hey, withdraw. And as long as you're after the challenge period, it'll let you, it'll let you do it. Cool. Um, let's just chill, chill our talk tomorrow. We have a talk tomorrow um, at 11-ish, I think, on the A2 stage, where we're going to talk about this general project in more of a road mapping kind of way. Like, you know, hey, great, we have a standard for this thing. What about the funding protocol? What about all the other stuff? We're going to talk about that. And um, hopefully now you know, like, you know, beginnings of standardization across channels, all of which we have some great working codes, a lot of which is on mainnet, which I might talk about today. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, future looks bright for state channel. So yeah, thanks for uh, listening. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about the protocols and the principles behind it, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, about the uh, user experience and, and the things that users have to do to interact with the chains. experience feature improvement that we did and then I'm just going to hand wavily allude to the rest of them and leave some time at the end and you guys can like sort of choose your own adventure for the last five minutes.
um, so the, yeah, the, uh, the structure of this talk is going to be um, about three slides of me showing the next. Uh, I've been told that I don't do that enough, so I'm just going to give people a background on what we do, um, and I have found that not a lot of people know yet. Um, and then after that, we're just we're going to jump right into the uh, channel provider standard that we're trying to implement um, both within our system and then also have that be usable uh, across other channel applications as well. Cool. Um, what is Connects? So we started out as a user experience company. Um, we spent a bunch of time trying to figure out like what the key barriers were to getting people to use Ethereum. Um, uh, initially, we thought it was sort of like a, a bridging mechanism. We needed to find better ways for people to bring their value on chain. Uh, and then we sort of realized, okay, wait, before people even bring their value on chain, uh, Ethereum doesn't scale, uh, and that and it's just a really stochastic, inconsistent environment, which is absolutely terrible for any kind of development on the web. Um, and, uh, and so uh, since then, uh, we kind of shifted to doing uh, channel stuff. Um, so about a year ago, we went live uh, with our first payment channel implementation, which was the Spank Chain uh, Payment Channel Hub. Um, that was actually at DevCon last year. Uh, and at DevCon last year, I said we were going to work on getting this integrated to more places and make it more usable, uh, which is sort of good because we did actually do that. Uh, and it turned out to be a lot harder than we expected uh, just because uh, when you put this stuff in front of people, you realize, oh, there's a lot of really like base assumptions around like how um, usable these things are in like a web environment, um, and uh, that we really needed to validate, and, and sometimes it really change. Um, so after after doing that, we uh, we realized about half a almost half a year later that the the best way to do that would just be to like build a full stack environment um, where we we were controlling everything from like the, the channel uh, protocol contracts all the way up to uh, the wallet layer, so we actually built a production-ready wallet, uh, the, the Dicard in browser, burner-style slash spank a style wallet, uh, and, and like influenced by both, and uh, and then put that on for a bunch of people uh, who actually used it like all the time. Still, a lot of people use it, uh, which is kind of cool. And it's it seems like mostly it's being used for like demos of, of channel stuff um, or as like a reference implementation. But it was really really helpful for us to understand. Oh wait, so many of these things are completely wrong. Um, and, uh, and then that directly led to us working with other more like other really interesting projects in the space, like uh, you know Detalk, Burner Wallet, Placento, and then MetaMask. Um, and so uh, it's it's kind of cool because we get we sort of incrementally built a lot of exposure as a result of doing this. Um, cool. Uh, where are we now? We went live with V2. V2 uh, uses the state channels framework, or at least a sort of precursor to it, uh, which will have like a very gradual, like very. Uh, smooth transition because the, the contracts are the same. Um, and then uh, we sort of aggregate all of these lessons that we learned from doing things really, really wrongly for a while. Uh, and then we, we also significantly improved our trust assumptions. So we said, we sort of looked back at the way that we were you know, building things and said, okay, how can we uh, reduce the amount of time the hub is holding onto user state? Uh, how can we not do the thing where we like kind of just pretend like the user is, like we sort of had this assumption in V1 where we were like, okay, well, the user can back up their state, but we're always just going to give them the hub state because we really don't want to ever have a case where like the user state breaks, and we just hadn't had the time to fix that yet. So it's so like things like that, which which are second level assumptions outside of the like base protocol environment, which are really important to think about as well. Cool. And then where we're going, uh, everyone keeps complaining that nobody's using channels, so we're going to make you lose them. <laughs> this is a this is sort of where we're like trying to integrate in the next few months, uh, and then hopefully do more from there. So we're uh, trying to like build this open ecosystem that people can tap into, uh, and then eventually decentralize a little bit more, like what uh, and Lightning looks like. Cool. Sorry, sorry for being chill. Back to uh, state channel roulette. Um, okay, so how can we make state channel roulette safe and easy open in the browser? And this is this is actually like a, a harder uh, task than most people realize because there's a lot of the, the sort of common things that people talk about, like uh, you know how do you back up user state in the browser. Uh, browsers are a really insecure environment. Uh, you you don't want to put your keys there, but you do want to put your state there, but you also do want to back up your state somewhere else. And then, then you have all these other headaches like, okay, well, in reality, users aren't just going to be on one browser all the time. They're probably going to want to have their channel available on multiple different devices. Uh, you know, and like when you when you do that, uh, how do you actually share state between all these devices? Uh, we kind of decided, okay, let's just focus in on one very specific problem which is the biggest user experience hurdle we've seen so far, which is that uh, the hardest part about using layer two is that layer one is awful. <laughs> and, uh, and like, 
anything, any point where layer two touches layer one is sort of the biggest uh, user experience nightmare. Um, a, a really good recent example of this is that uh, we spent like a year with our channels on mainnet, never ran into this problem until about two weeks ago when the whole Fairwind thing happened. And then for the, out of nowhere, users started saying like, hey, like I'm not able to deposit into my channel, I'm not actually able to like, put money in there, what's going on, is your stuff broken, like what is, you know, what is happening? And we were like, what the hell is happening? All of our stuff says it's fine, we don't understand that. Uh, anyway, we, we actually looked on Etherscan, we realized like user transactions were taking six hours to find. Um, and, uh, and so like, uh, our, our contract implements a timeout because we don't want users to sort of deposit and then just like leave, like or say that they're going to deposit and then just like leave it forever. Uh, and this is a, this is a, this is sort of a safety mechanism, both for, like mostly for the user because we were like, okay, well, you know, if a user forgets to deposit or something goes wrong, like messages doesn't get sent or something like that, uh, we don't want them to have an unusable channel. Um, and so it's good because it worked, but it's terrible because everybody was like, oh, your channel's broken. Um, so uh, this is this is a really good example of like situations where you you don't really understand uh, like what is going to happen on chain because it's such a sto stochastic environment. Um, so we sort of in V2 said okay let's not only improve the user experience of depositing and get rid of this timeout but also um, try to make it so that users never really have to go on chain or like really can just pick up their channel take it with them everywhere that they go. Um, so. Uh, what does that look like? So there's a there's a really interesting existing example of how this works. Uh, when you use any decentralized application today, uh, the the old way to do it was that you'd have to actually like recover your keys and apps, right? And that was awful because then you're trusting the app with your keys. Uh, obviously, that's terrible in the browser. Um, and uh, and it, as a as a solution to that, is like we we came up with this like key provider. Uh, standard uh, that like MetaMask implemented, a bunch of other wallets implemented, where you have your key hosted in this remote, much more safe environment. Uh, like usually, I say environment like a, like an extension or your phone. Uh, the key can be put into a key store. It can be kept in a place where uh, you really only have like uh, very uh, very like narrow pipe of, of function that can pass in and out. And uh, and then you you sort of make hooked calls from from your browser environment to that remote uh, that remote key. Um, and so we, we sort of looked at this and said, okay, wait, why uh, can we not just do this for channels as well? Um, and, uh, and actually Bruno from MetaMask helped us a ton with figuring this out. Uh, but uh, it, was, it turns out we could. Um, and uh, and what, we, what we sort of ended up doing was treating uh, the, the, the core channel code that's implemented by, uh, by like state channels or org project uh, as, a, as like an isolated piece that sits within the wallet because it's sort of it's trusted code. Uh, in the sense that it, it is like the user's code that validates that the state that they're getting is real. Uh, so you want it to be in a trusted environment because you don't want somebody to, to write wrong validators or like a browser to implement the validators weirdly and give you a weird state. Um, and so we said, okay, let's just treat that uh, along with the key that's been getting passed into it as like a normal key and then do the exact same thing. Um, inject a provider to the channels instead uh, from a, a, an application that exists on front end. Uh, like in, in a browser context, back into this remote wallet. Um, cool. So, what does this look like? So, uh, in a wallet, uh, this basically means spinning up a client, uh, and it can be Next, uh, or it can be any other state channel framework client that anybody wants to build right now or in the future. Uh, this is the great thing about standards. Um, and then, uh, and then map all those client methods to a channel provider. Uh, it's a pretty standard interface. We actually just took the same interface for now, and like at, in the future, we can uh, amend that as needed. But I, I, I sort of suspect that it's uh, it's probably going to stay roughly like this for a while. Um, and then, uh, and the way that that looks uh, from an implementation perspective for wallets is like a, the ERC. Is it one three three seven? No, it's one one three seven. I don't know. There's a there's a standard RPC like JSON RPC interface. Um, and so you can just copy paste that and then just implement these methods and, and it would work. Um, and then uh, uh, basically like set up the like, button into whatever context, however you want. So there's a few different ways to do this. Uh, you can set it in, into the in-browser context uh, using like, uh, like Chrome messaging, uh, like, like MetaMask or Portis or Formatic do. Um, you can also use something like Wallet Connect, which is an isolated protocol for, for actually bridging two environments together. Uh, you can also do this like uh, you can have like a like a hardware device uh, and and like do this using some other messaging system. Uh, so like you can sort of imagine like the con context around this is really interesting. Like paying for parking, uh, you can just like 
tap your phone and then confirm on your phone, and like you're you're not actually injecting your channel, like you're injecting your channel into like the uh, the barrier. You're not actually like recovering your key on the barrier and then paying, which would be awful. Um, uh, and then and then on the DAP, it's even easier. This is this is the this is the part that we kind of want to optimize on. Uh, is we just wanted to make it incredibly easy for people to leverage channels. Um, so if you get to the point where like. Uh, a lot of bullets are using this channel provider standard. Uh, as, a, as a DAP, it's basically just like the existing ease provider standard. You just say, if this dot .context dot .channel provider, uh, get the channel provider from the context, pass it into whatever client implementation you want that runs on the same framework, uh, and now all of a sudden you, you have access to a user's remote channel. If they don't have a channel, you can create one, um, but uh, otherwise, most times you can just call functions on the channel like normal, and they'll just get passed up to the, to the remote wallet. Um, what is the consequence of this? So, uh, actually, one more slide of just how it works as a reviewing case. Uh, uh, wallet, when you hit the spin, uh, and, and you're like on release, what that's doing is calling, like updating the state, uh, on, like basically like proposing a state. It's like the best analogy that I can think of is basically like invoicing your channel, uh, and uh, and that invoice is for any sort of state update, and uh, and so then you get that on your phone, you confirm on your phone. Uh, your wallet can decide how they want to show that experience to you, whether they want you to sign on every transaction or sign on just like like your app install. Um, but you confirm on your phone and then uh, and then that, that like your, your sort of state is updated and then that's reflected back in the application. Cool. Why do it this way? Um, so this is uh, we, we learned from experience would be one that like while building things using channels are awesome. Uh, the process of actually getting users to interact with the channels themselves, uh, like on chain, is just brutal. Uh, and like the uh, like the integra integratability of V1 was severely affected by that. So like as you you sort of probably saw that our V1 of Connects uh, really was integrated mostly with bullets. And the reason that that was the case was because having to build an, like a completely isolated like application meant that. Uh, users had to deposit into that application separately. And every single person we went to and asked about that said, oh, we're already doing all of this work to try to onboard people into Ethereum, and now you're asking us to onboard people as a separate step into Connects. Um, and that just doesn't make sense for people. Um, two, it is actually the easiest possible way to integrate the channels in your DAO. Like, there's, there's no, we, we haven't yet found a way to make it as simple to just make calls to a remote channel uh, than, than this, and if you do find a way, like, let us know, we would love to make it even simpler. Um, and then, lastly, uh, this makes the safety of your channel exactly the same as the safety of your existing Ethereum wallet. Um, Ethereum wallets are a productized space. Uh, unlike most of the other work that is being done in this space, like Ethereum wallets have like, material user traction, and they are being used in production, and so they've had production problems, and they've had you know things like key leakages, uh, like user funds being lost, uh, like dependency issues that cause people to get hacked, right? Like, those are the sorts of things that, that, like, you need to worry about to bring channels to production, and, like, this does make channels and operating in a channelized environment the same as what exists with Ethereum calls today. Cool. Um, so there's, there's a, uh, that's sort of the channel provider stuff that we've been thinking through. Uh, that's live-ish now. Uh, it's, like, on staging, and we're waiting to put it into master. Uh, this is another consequence of like having people using V1 in prod. Is like, it, it we actually have to like migrate everybody, and that that takes time. It's a coordination burden. Uh, we can't just like release it. Um, and so we're we're in the process of doing that right now. Uh, but once that happens, you'll be able to use this within like a couple of contexts at least. Um, uh, the other sort of user experience things that we've kind of seen were, were useful from this from this last iteration were things like treating your channel as like a wallet. Um, in the in the state channels case it's literally true that your channel is a multi-sig wallet. And that's really awesome because now you can uh, leverage all of the other you know user experience paradigms that people have been building like meta transactions. So for instance, getting rid of doing gas extraction for the user completely. Right? Like they, they're able to deposit into their wallet, not paying gas make a bunch of off-chain transfers, and then withdraw in a way where the, where the, the like, counterparty or the hub operator or somebody else is the one that's actually paying the gas cost. Um, transfers to offline recipients. Uh, availability is a really big issue on the web, um, not just because people go offline and because the internet also is a decentralized system that is stochastic, but also because like people aren't always going to be around to receive your payments. 
Um, so that, that's something that we really, really focus hard on. Uh, Plug-in state backups of users, so this is things like PISA uh, for watchtowers, but then this also means uh, even just having the user be able to use their in, like their channel or uh, their application in a bunch on a bunch of different devices at the same time, or maybe not on the same, at the same time, but at least like in like in sequence, um, and then only deploying like on chain again, only making on chain transactions when you absolutely have to. So moving your channel deployment to to uh, withdrawal uh, using create two. Um, cool. So this is your menu. Uh, is there anything here that you'd like me to cover or any other topics? Because I think aside from this, I was just going to uh, leave it open for questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a great talk, first. And uh, just a plain strange uh, question. Can you try to part of the mining tools to process your transactions faster? Uh, no. That is an interesting idea. Um, to be honest, we haven't even thought of it. Uh, we just said, okay, let's. So, so like, it's a decentralized system, and it gets more decentralized over time as like we decentralize our hub, right? Um, we don't want it to necessarily be the case that mining pools, like, I'm sure this will happen at some point, but we don't want it to become the case that mining pools become political around like which connects uh, related organizations actually get their transaction process processed. Uh, ideally, we just solve the problem at its, at, at its root. There, there will still be this issue of depositing and withdrawing. Um, but if we can move it to a point where it can happen asynchronously, then it doesn't matter matter if it takes six hours, right? Like it can it's something where like you can start a deposit for a hundred dollars at the start of your day and then like leave and then use your channel later on in the day and not, not even know that it didn't go through. Yeah. Okay, so my question about the signage, it uh, probably is still within the MetaMask. Uh, for every message I need to sign, do I see the pop up? Yeah, that's a good question. It's sort of up to the um, someone like MetaMask, how they want to implement that. Uh, it's like, because the, the uh, so, so this is sort of a nuance that, that I didn't really cover, but like, um, the part of the way that state channels uh, is implemented right now is like, there's a, there's, you need a mnemonic because there's, uh, each application actually has a unique key. Um, and so you use a mnemonic to carve out a unique key path for, uh, for this specific framework that is different from all the keys that you would normally get on, on Ethereum. Uh, the, re the rationale behind this is that it's actually like a really easy way to enforce um, uh, stopping replayability across different apps and like handles a whole host of conditions and then also theoretically when you decentralize it should also make things more private. Um, because that's the case, uh, what, we, what we've actually found for most wallets is that they've said, okay, well, we'll just use a channel specific mnemonic and we'll just treat that differently in terms of signatures. We'll just build a completely different user experience for signatures over there. Um, that's, I think that that probably makes sense, and it's going to be, we, we, like, we don't want to be too opinionated, so we're trying to leave it outside of Next for now. Um, but I suspect that what will probably happen is something like, you know, sign on install, uh, and like, uh, on installing an app, and then like maybe sign on certain cases, and maybe we can like expose, expose a, fa a flag for like what seems safe to sign. But the state will be in for a binder. What do you How mean? do I even read it? So um, say, hey, you're signing this text Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's metadata attached to it, right? Like you're, you, the, the, the state that you're getting is like the signature, but then it's also like an encoded application state. Right, right, right. So you can always decode the application state and yeah. check it. Uh, and we can do that within our client and pass oh. it back. Yeah. It's a lot like hardware wallets. Pardon? It's a lot like hardware wallets. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a, there's a usability, like security trade off there. Uh, the cool thing about having application specific key is like worst comes to worst, if somebody like compromises your funds, the like or you lose the key or some horrible thing happens, you lose only the application's funds. Uh, and not the rest of your stuff. Um, which is which is like the same. Yeah. <laughs> That's also a lot better. <laughs> oh great point, by the way. I oh. think you probably quite interesting. Um, so my question is the other projects have a similar problem, and there's something really key that you have to deal with, but that's really easy to solve. Like the nature of that when you book when you draw comes to transaction, that's really easy. Uh do you mean for uh, for like like yeah, making the on-chain transaction happen? Yeah, the example yeah. where the transaction can be for six hours. Yeah, yeah, so that so that's actually interesting. So like it's sort of up to 
it's sort of up to the law implementer how they choose to do this, right? Like, because they're the one, or like, I guess the client implementer, right? Because they're the ones that are making the on-chain transaction. Um, in, in that case, in this specific case, it was actually a, a transaction going from MetaMask to pay, and then Bruno and I talked about this. And like, literally it was just that like, it was set to exactly the like recommended, I think it was safe flow gas price, and uh, and then he bumped it up like by like five to ten percent, and then it was fine. But it was just it just happened to be the case that at the time safe like the safe flow gas price was being uh, effectively dosed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh. I was required to allow you to join a channel with no on-chain transactions. Is there like a source of funds from Next or? Yeah, so you always have like one, okay, let me take it that way. Uh, you always have, okay, you always have one on-chain transaction to get funds into a channel, right? Um, sometimes it can be paid by the hub and then they can send you money in the channel, so you can, you can imagine like I buy funds that are already in a channel using a, a, like wire or something like that. Um, in this case, like the user is still depositing into their channel, uh, but we're saying, okay, instead of depositing every single time you want to do anything, uh, like use any application, we're saying you deposit once with your wallet, uh, and then whatever balance you have there, you don't really need to withdraw it. You just sort of keep it there. It's safe. Uh, nothing's really going to happen to it. And like it's completely non-custodial. You can just take it with you wherever you want. And then at some point in the future, if you want to, you can withdraw. Yeah. The real thing that we're, we're extremely excited about, like the channel provider stuff, is uh, it, it becomes like we, we want to get to the point where like you're able to leverage state channels without actually needing to be a state channel application. So like being able to say like if channel provider, if like if like a channel exists, make this payment using the channel. And if it doesn't exist, then make it on chain. Right? And that's that's automatically going to give like massive scalability benefits with this ecosystem. Oh, I think we got that there. Are we good? We're good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. and operating the state channel networks in real, uh, real world production. Uh, and before we get on to some of the technical details, I want to take five minutes to talk about the adoption of the state channel. Okay. So just a few months ago, uh, Seven Network just launched its uh, mainnet, and during the mainnet, we basically re released three things. Uh, the first thing is our user-facing mobile application called StatX, which is a real money esports gaming platform that building on top of the state channel network. Uh, the second is that for the game developers, we also uh, released the StatX gaming SDK. Okay, so help them to submit and publish their games onto their StatX mobile app and enjoy the benefits brought by their state channel solutions. Okay. And finally, for the blockchain developers, we also released the, uh, the Stellar Web SDK that can help the uh, blockchain developers to leverage their state channel uh, primitives like the conditional payments and the plugging into the application. And this is a short demo about the CLX mobile app where basically the players can play the skill-based blockchain games uh, on top of CLX and win crypto prizes like Ether, Dai, or Setter. And the entire price payout process and also some of the games are entirely built on top of state channel technology. So it is real-time interactive with no latency and zero gas space. And also it is as secure as the online blockchain. And so far the players has spent over 1.6 billion US dollars uh, onto this app. And uh, there has been over 300,000 uh, games play on top of uh, set apps. And currently, our monthly active users is over uh, 12,000, and is probably one of the most active decentralized applications on Ethereum right now. And our users are also spread across 89 countries in the world. Okay, 
And also for the game developers, uh, some of the questions that they might ask is that can I build my own games on top of Serenax? Because Serenax is in, in itself uh, is built on top of the state channel uh, 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 network uh, solutions. So do they need to understand the Serenax technology? Do they need to handle the option payment? Do they need to manage users' private keys? So the answer is no. And we also released the Serenax Gaming SDK. So as a game developer, as long as you have a vanilla HTML5 game with just adding two lines of code, you can integrate your game with ZX Gaming SDK and enjoy the benefits uh, of using the state channel network solutions. And it also requires zero blockchain experiences. And we, because we also want to bring the developers that is outside the blockchain community into the blockchain space. And on the left is it shows how you might integrate with the uh, uh, ZX Gaming SDK and uh, on the right is our game developer portal which you can basically control and uh, there's a sub game submission and publishing process. Okay. And so far we have got over 250 developers registered on the developer board and they have already submitted over 100 games onto the, uh, the developer portal. And another interesting data is that the first time integration time for integrating with the Serax Gaming SDK is just less than 30 minutes. So that highlights the easiness of uh, integrating with the Serax Gaming SDK. Okay. And finally, we also provide a Serax Web SDK. So this is uh, uh, exposed many of the useful low-level uh, state channel primitives that could help them to develop layer two applications such as conditional payment. So on top of that, uh, they can build many interesting applications like the prediction market. Next, I will spend the rest of the talk talking about the, some of the uh, technical design of our uh, state channel network. And in particular, we just released the full protocol specification about our uh, implementation of state channel network. If you're interested, feel free to check out this link for more details. And today, I'm going to give a very high level uh, overview about the key de design principles that we use while building and operating the state channel network. Okay, uh, so here is the high level architecture uh, for the network. So, uh, so basically, the gray area shows a generic conditional payment network. So this network has uh, lots of uh, larger relay nodes connected to each other and also has a lot of smaller end users connected to these relay nodes. Okay? And this uh, conditional payment network has a layer one anchor to different public blockchains, which is essentially uh, a set of uh, uh, smart contracts that handle the off-chain to on-chain interactions, such as opening a channel, depositing, withdrawal, set of channel, and all these kind of operations. So uh, within this conditional payment network, any client can send a payment to uh, any other clients in this network. Okay? But this is not just a simple payment. So we allow the payment to have an arbitrary dependency on the outcome of a certain application logic. And this is called conditional payment. Okay? So for example, Alice can send Bob $10 if Bob is a winner of the chess game. So here is the payment from Alice to Bob is conditioned on the outcome of the chess game. Okay. So uh, we, uh, in Serenet Network, uh, Network, we provide a fairly generalized interface that bridges the payment part and also the high-level uh, uh, application logic. So, so basically, we decouple the channel fund assignments and also the high-level state progression of the application logic. So basically, you can uh, build a lot of uh, uh, state channel applications and they share a one common uh, channel from the assignment uh, network. And uh, uh, this kind of decoupling and layer architecture allows the two modules to be updated and evolve independently, just like today's internet. And I will introduce the, the benefits brought by this kind of decoupling and layer architecture later. Okay. So now let's first look at how uh, Set Network handles the hop by hop forwarding of the conditional payments. Okay. So uh, the first core data structure that we use here is called the conditional payment channel. So, so in Set Network, we allow the full duplex channel, so which basically allows the two peers to send payments to each other concurrently without inter interfering with each other. Okay. So in order to implement this kind of with duplex channel, each peer will maintain a, a simplex payment channel data structure, which basically maintains the current transfer amount from this peer to the other point. 
Okay. So here we use the protobuf method to show what kind of information needs to be included in the simplex payment channel data structure. For example, you need to uh, include the channel ID, the, the peer address, the sequence number, the amount of money you have transferred from this peer to the other peer, and also, most importantly, we also have a list that maintains the currently pending payments in this state channel. I know that this is different from the, uh, some of the existing state channel design, which use the Merkle route for storing and verifying the current pending payment in the channel. So here, because uh, we, don't, we don't use Merkle route here, because uh, Merkle route is mostly used for, for the case where you have a pen only operations, but in the state channel, especially the conditional payment channel, uh, you will have a lot of uh, frequent insertion and deletion of the payment object. So in this case, using Merkle root will incur many uh, unnecessary <coughs> computational complexity when computing the Merkle root and also verifying the Merkle root. Especially we need, when you need to do some on-chain verification of the uh, pending uh, uh, payments. Okay. So we just uh, use a list that maintains a list of IDs for the currently pending payments. Okay. And the second important uh, data structure that we use is uh, it's called the conditional payment. So a conditional payment has a pay timestamp and also the source destination for the conditional payment. And also it includes a list of conditions that this payment is dependent on. Okay. And most importantly, there's also a transfer function which, tells, which specifies uh, how we should resolve this payment depending on the outcome of this condition. <coughs> and in, here we provide many useful primitives for, for resolving a conditional payment. For example, the boolean end means, uh, logic means that uh, the, the, the source needs to pay the destination, the full uh, payment amount, if all of the conditions included in this payment are becoming true. But we also provide other kind of resolution logic such as boolean all, boolean circuit, and also the logic to handle the numerical conditions. So basically, the source can send the destination an arbitrary amount depending on the outcome of the conditions. Okay, uh, so here's a, a kind of uh, a high, high level overview about the, the messaging protocol with a single hop. Basically, how you forward the conditional payment to the next hop. So the first step is that for the source to set up the payment with the destination, it only involves one round trip of messages. The source just say, okay, hey, I request a conditional payment to you, and the destination just re responds back. Okay? And when you uh, uh, want to resolve a payment, it's basically saying that, okay, this condition has been finalized, uh, we have finished the chess game, I, want, I, I commit that I can send you the money, then uh, the source and destination will settle the payment option. Uh, this also involves only one round trip of messages. And when necessary, uh, the source or destination can also choose to dispute or settle uh, or resolve the payment on chain in case that there's someone tries to cheat or there's some disagreement about the uh, payment state or the application logic. And also, we use the sliding window techniques in order to uh, allow the, the source to send multiple concurrent payments uh, to the destination without receiving its act. So this kind of uh, sliding window techniques uh, significantly improve the, the kind of throughput we can get uh, within a single hub. Okay. And uh, that's also inspired by the current internet design. Okay, so just to summarize the kind of uh, uh, properties that we, we got uh, on a single hub level, uh, we, we use, uh, so this kind of hub by hub conditional payment already is single because it only involves very few uh, round trip messages and it also supports a full duplex channel. Okay. And also we achieve high throughput also through the full duplex channel implementation and also the sliding window uh, implementation. Okay. So, uh, so currently what I'm talking about is all about the hop by hop forwarding. So what's happening within a single hop? So what about the, the multi-hop? What kind of things we can build on top of this hop by hop conditional payment permitted? Okay. So what, uh, in other words, what kind of the end-to-end -end design permitted that we can provide on top of this? Okay. And the end-to-end -end design pattern is also very important in the traditional distributed system and also the internet. Uh, if you look at this kind of uh, very classical paper by David Clark uh, with the back to the age of the uh, beginning of the internet, you can see that there's also a lot of design patterns for the end-to-end -end in computer systems. Okay. 
so our design principles when we design those end-to-end -end, uh, uh, patterns is basically twofold. First, we want to cleanly decouple the channel found allocation process and the high-level state progression of the application logic. And second, we want to push the complexity to the edge while reducing the kind of uh, relay nodes complexity. This is to ensure that the bank owned network, as just like today's internet, is as secure and as, as robust as possible. Okay, and on top of that, we provide several useful end-to-end -end, uh, design patterns. Uh, the first is called the multi-hop payment uh, with pooling conditions. So with this design pattern, basically the source can pay the destination a full amount if this condition becomes true. And uh, this is a very simple design pattern that it, it is probably one of the most commonly used scenario in practice. For example, in our CLX mobile applications, we use this design permitted to implement the head-to-head -head game competition. And also it can cover the use case like the prediction market or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, social betting and also include some of the casino applications like uh, roulette uh, applications uh, as mentioned earlier. And this are uh, basically the highlight overview about the communication protocols when you uh, when, when we're trying to implement the multiple payment with the contributions. So for the sake of time, I will not uh, go into the details about these protocols. If you, uh, everything is including in the uh, pro uh, protocol specification doc, if you're interested, feel free to check it out. Okay. And also you can settle the payment option and the destination can also reject the payment option. And also, uh, the, uh, the source of destination can also cho choose to resolve the payment function uh, if necessary. Okay. Uh, but note, note here that, uh, so in our design, the relay nodes never need to send any any function transactions. Uh, only the source of the destination needs to do that. So this is greatly uh, reduce the complexity for the relay nodes and also ensure they are secure and also robust in the bank vault. Okay. okay, so to summarize, the, the kind of properties with the multi-hop payment with pooling conditions. Uh, it is simple because the relay nodes never needs to uh, care about the, the application logic. It's just dumbly forwarding the, the conditional payment to the next call. And it's also uh, low cost because in, uh, the relay nodes never needs to send the on-chain transaction. Uh, and in most of the cases, it does not even has a single view-only function on the event working. So that's greatly reduces its complexity. And it is also secure because there, it is resilient to any arbitrary malicious app behavior and it is also low in the messaging overhead. And the second end-to-end uh, -end design permit is that we provide is, uh, is, a, uh, is, is a new numerical conditions, uh, which basically means that the, the source can pay the destination an arbitrary amount depending on the outcome of their uh, condition. So this can enable some of the other interesting use, uh, use cases like uh, a second price auction, where the auction winner can pay well pay their second highest price to the uh, auctioneer. Okay. And also some other use cases like usage based car insurance and, and their uh, cloud hosting service and so forth. Okay. And these are the protocols uh, which I'll skip here. Okay. So, uh, so, so far to summarize the kind of end-to-end -end design parameters that we got, uh, namely the multi-hop payment with pooling condition, multi-hop payment with numerical condition, their design principle for them is that we highly optimize for the majority of the use cases. So that for the majority of use cases, it's highly efficient and also uh, secure and robust. And with these two end-to-end -end design parameters, we can build a, a dependency on lots of uh, application logic. So for example, uh, you can build a turn-based state channel app application like the Gongko app that we're building. And also, also you, uh, the, the application could also be some the, the on-chain app like the Oracle services built by Chainlink. And also it could even be some application logic running on the roll-up chain or the commit chain. Okay. So that's great, uh, give us a lot of flexibility. But uh, besides the, the two kinds of uh, primitives that we build, we also allow, for example, you can also build up your own, uh, for example, founding protocols like uh, uh, the Nitro protocol that we are going to talk about tomorrow. 
uh, uh, a set end to end like for new protocol primitives. And also on the application layer, you can also uh, build a, a force move gate based state channel applications. So we provide this kind of flexibility to plug in your own application logic or your end to end channel funding uh, logic. So, so this kind of stacked and layered architecture design is just like the today's internet uh, architecture. Whereas online you have a unified IP layer. So this is just like the IP layer for the value transfer network. And the uh, next is the transport layer that handles the end-to-end -end, uh, control. And on top of that, you can build a different uh, application layer protocols like HTTP, FTP, and SMTP. And all the layers share a common and unified interface between different layers. OK, so just to summarize and give, give us some of the key uh, takeaways here is that when we design our state channel networks, we have uh, several key design principles in, 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 in mind. Uh, the first uh, design principle is, of course, the design should be secure and also trust-free. And the second thing is that we want to minimize the on-chain footprint uh, when we are, uh, are building the state channel network because the uh, on-chain transaction cost and also the latency is very high. And certainly, we also want to minimize the, the relay, uh, on the relay node, the complexity while pushing the complexity to the H node. Okay. And the fourthly, we also want to minimize the on-chain non-transaction interactions. Uh, for example, such as uh, view-only functions or the event watching, this might be in contrast to uh, many people's thoughts that the uh, on-chain view-only functions or the event watching is free because it is instant. But the, the reality is that uh, if you run the state channel network or you run your decentralized, decentralized applications in production, you will need to also pay for this view-only function or the event watching if you are using some of the blockchain infrastructure services like Mafura uh, or Acme. And uh, that comes with a price. And also, calling a view-only function or, or doing a event watching also incurs much larger latency than you doing that with a local storage server or you, or you exchange message with your peer. Okay. And lastly, we also want to minimize the object communication overhead. Okay. So with these design principles in mind, uh, we, we take several design choices. For example, the key thing is that we try to decouple uh, the uh, channel found assignment process and the high level state progression of the application logic. And, uh, uh, and this kind of design principles are also highly uh, optimized for the majority of the use cases. Uh, and also, there are some design patterns that we, I don't mention here. For example, uh, we use a blockchain agnostic black structure with protobuf, uh, such as uh, both off chain, on chain, and different public blockchains can share the common uh, data schema. And then we even build out our own like a protobuf compiler uh, uh, for the uh, solidity, and uh, it's all in our GitHub repo. If you are interested, feel free to check it out. And we also support the zero runtime contract and the protobuf great. This is something I've not mentioned, but it's including the bug. And finally, uh, the kind of layered and covered architecture is flexible for future use cases. So. Uh, it's hard to squeeze in, uh, squeeze in everything in 20 minutes, but this is just a high-level overview. So everything is including our protocol specification doc. So feel free to check out. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. I'm from Iran. Um, we are actually two teams based in Nashville, Germany. And I'm speaking for the research team. And I want to present some um, observations we made while we were looking into the mini party channels. Recently, and then later as last time, is going to present a little bit about what's going on on the individual side first. Okay, so multi party. Okay, this is not working. Okay, um, so when we talked about the roulette example, we talked about how we can connect two players, but quite often in the real world, we want to connect more than two people, for example, three or as many as we want. And for this, we can build, of course, a smart contract in Ethereum, but what we want is we want to also build it off-chain in a multi-party channel that connects more than two parties. And this is something we've been researching, and um, to, to already give you the result, it's possible, but sometimes it's surprisingly expensive. So what I want to do in this talk is talk a little bit about the challenges, where it gets uh, difficult to design this, and where designers of, of apps for this kind of channels have to be a little bit careful. 
So the first question is how do we set it up? Well, we've heard about how to set up a normal channel, and uh, in most of these constructions, you can just set it up as a multi-party channel. So it's actually not that different. But we also talked about networks. Wait, all these networks can be connected always to people. So can we take this existing network and also build multi-party channels on top of it? And the answer is yes. So in, in order to connect Alice, Bob, and Charlie here, we have to restructure this a little bit or organize this a little bit, and then we can build up on top of it. But the nice thing is we don't have to go on-chain at all for this. We can do all of this off-chain in the existing network. So the first step is we have to find a path that connects all three of these players. The second step is we have to actually get rid of all of the people on the path that we don't want to actually be part of the channel. So in this case, we have to pick out the block. And the next step is we add a channel contract, a multi-party channel contract, to our state channels. Just as we would like to uh, build another virtual channel. And inside of this channel contract, we can now put any kind of multi-party application that we want to run. For example, all of the that. But there's actually a downside. When we talk about channels and networks, we already have quite some collateral to, to look at, and in multi-party channels, this could even worse. So, for example, Bob in this case connects Alice and Charlie, and when they want to play a game, and all of them, let's say, invest one coin, then Bob has to be able to pay out two coins to Alice. Alice has to submit one coin to the channel contract, and Bob has to submit his own coin that Alice might win, and the one of Charlie, so two coins into this channel contract. And the same actually on the other side as well. So, well, he's technically only playing for one coin, he has to do well four coins just to make this possible. And this is quite bad when you have a very long channel with a lot of people. So you have more and more collateral. So it might make sense if you play for a lot of money to actually build a new multi party channel directly on the ledger. Because then you get rid of this problem. Nevertheless, it is possible to use existing networks and build multi party channels on top of it. And for low for for a low amount of money this makes a lot of sense. Okay, so another thing that we looked into is how to progress the state in a in a channel. Um, the one that we've seen so far is this step-by-step -step or force move approach where, every, where you always have a turn. So um, when Alice's uh, turn is she provides her input, then it's Bob's turn, who confirms Alice's input, then it's Charlie's turn, who confirms both Bob's and Alice's input, and then actually we take two more turns until all of the inputs are confirmed. So we need quite some steps. Well, this is three parties, so it's not so bad, but we feel a lot of parties might take quite a while until all of the inputs are confirmed. And unless we have the lay step, so unless we have all of the confirmations, we never actually know if this is something we can really enforce on chain. So another way of progressing states, which makes some case some sense in, in large multi-party channels, is to do it in parallel. So everyone in parallel submits the inputs to everyone else. So this is a lot of communication end to end. Then everyone runs the contract function on all of these inputs, so that means to be like some sort of sorting. There is no first come first serve in this way, but if you don't care, then you can just run one function on all of these inputs, have a new state, and then everyone sends around their confirmation <coughs> on the new state. And then in two steps, we have all the confirmations and all of the inputs in parallel. And this is two interesting concepts. I don't want to say what, which one makes more sense, but it's interesting to have both in mind when you design a game because some games are really made for each of these uh, state compression uh, models because when you have a sequential game like poker, it really, one step depends on the next one. So it really makes sense to go in a sequential way. But if you have, um, for example, if you want to generate randomness, everyone has to send their input together. So it might make sense to use a parallel approach. You can even mix them, have steps where you do parallel and then have other steps that you do sequentially. And um, then there's a third thing that I want to highlight, which is what happens if the party awards. This is kind of easy to solve in a two-party setting because if one of them stops responding, well, you stop. But in an end-party setting, it might make sense to actually want to continue running the game even if one party is, well, let's say you're playing poker and one of them doesn't have any funds anymore, so you cannot continue playing, but the others might want to finish their poker game. 
But on the other hand, they don't want to have this empty, so this party that kind of lost already to confirm every part, every step, uh, because why, why would it? So you want to maybe exclude a party in the channel. And this is another new concept that so far was not very interesting. And there's actually two cases that we exclude parties in. The first one is when this party agrees, which might be the poker case, uh, poker example, when this person is like, okay, I lost, I'm out, here I confirm that I'm out. So this you can do off-chain, you don't have to go on-chain. But then there's also another case where some party simply aborts and just, okay, whatever, I don't care anymore, I leave. I'm out of funds, what do I do? And in this case, you actually have to go on-chain to change the underlying consent rules or consensus rules. Um, but still, this has to be designed on game level because it's really important that a few of us cannot exclude someone if they want to. So you have to be quite careful about the security. Why this is an important feature in this kind of contracts or this kind of games, it's also very dangerous. So think about this a lot when you design a game. Even worse than this is the fairness problem. Fairness is in general something that is really hard to achieve in multi-party scenarios. And this is always tricky when people start to collude. So in this case, let's see that Charlie and Bob collude against Alice in the roulette example. As we've heard before from, from Tom, how you generate randomness, so how you basically determine the winner in roulette, is with this commit reveal steps. So first everyone commits to the randomness, and they reveal it, and then they run a function which says who's actually the winner. So Charlie and Bob collude now, then Charlie actually in the sixth round knows all of the information to see who's the winner. So Charlie can say, okay, if Alice actually won, we are losing these two points here, so I should rather avoid. And of course for Charlie this could be bad because he gets slashed and his money gets burned, but for Bob this is actually a good thing because he keeps his coin and when they repeat the game, he still has 50-50 chance that he might win his own and Alice's coin. So in the end, they will, they have quite a high chance of, of still getting some of the money. So it will always make sense for Charlie to reward. And it's really hard to protect against this. So one way of protecting against this is with very expensive punishments. So Bob or Charlie must lose that much money that it cannot be worthwhile to run this collusion attack. And uh, but this really, this grows exponentially with the amount of parties because now also Bob could with Alice, and he must be able to, like, uh, Bob must be secure in case he won. And uh, it's, it's, it's getting really bad when you have a lot of parties. And the other idea is to have external randomness, to agree on maybe some, some block hash in the future uh, that also adds a little bit of randomness, so Bob uh, Charlie won't be able to see exactly who's the winner when they have to reveal. But still, this is something which is really tricky to design and something that I want to mention because it's important to keep this in mind when you design your party channels and contracts. Okay, and now I hand over to Sebastian who's going to present some details about the Okay, so I'm Sebastian Stadler. Stuff for a few months now at the uh, Tech for University of uh, Darmstadt. Um, so, the first thing I want to talk about is some general thoughts about what should be included in the stational framework and what should not be included. I mean, this is not like a general rule, this is just like the goals we had and the things that we decided on what we want to include them up. Yeah. So, definitely, what should always be included is the protocol engine, right? so everything that defines the protocol and the things that's included. Yeah. This also includes the distributed logic. And of course, very important is uh, persistence. So because you run an off-chain protocol, an off-chain application, you always have to persist. For example, the state update, the signatures that you receive, the signatures that you send, keep track of the nonsense, keep track of other data. Maybe you have some like the protocols that you execute. So all of this has to be persistent. And if you really design a framework, you have to think about this very carefully: how you persist and when you persist. Um, you also want to have an off-chain wallet, so you might design your system to have ephemeral keys. We talked about this slightly, so sometimes you want to generate a new key for each channel. Um, so then you would have like an off-chain wallet that generates those keys, and then you keep track of those keys, but you don't have on-chain wallets. 
so this is also something that only makes sense to include. Um, and then of course, uh, because you now have a complete off-chain application, you, you actually have a networking application, right? So you have a wire protocol, so you design a protocol, and this, this, is not, so this is nothing that really communicates with the blockchain or anything. This is really the protocol how the, how the different um, like participants in the network uh, communicate with each other. So, for example, you want to agree on a channel, right? You want to agree on participants. Uh, uh, you want to agree on the parameters that the channel is working on. So you have to exchange messages here. So this is also something that we call the wire protocol. And things that might not be included, is for example, um, an on-chain wallet. So you probably want to um, send requests, callbacks back to the user um, or for on-chain funding or for the channel. So you also probably don't want to keep track of on-chain uh, 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 keys. So that, uh, that's also the reason why sometimes you might want to uh, implement this all as, for example, a MetaMask extension. So you can relay re 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 so you can relay uh, MetaMask to do this on-chain stuff that you do with all the on-chain uh, logic. And you also don't necessarily need to implement a network communication layer. So it could be that you only define the messages as you define the wire protocol, but maybe you, you develop a library that hooks into another application. So this application already has some kind of networking layer, so you can uh, just duplex the, the, the communication here. You just send callbacks, okay, send this message, and you set up a subscription, and then you get the messages that are for the framework. So you don't need to provide this, but you can. Um, and then, of course, uh, the framework itself doesn't necessarily include the apps. So the apps is like another concept outside of this. So the apps are built on top of the framework and are not part of the framework. Um, so, when we do, so one thing we can do is state channel SDK. This is what we're doing right now internally. So this is the first step. This is the inner core of it. That's the library. So the state channel SDK is just this situation. We have like a we have an application and it already uses the Ethereum blockchain and now we want to enable it to give it a uh, state channel. So what we do is uh, we plug in the uh, like a state channel SDK, for example, with the paper library. And then suddenly you can also do off-chain direct uh, transactions. Um, the complexity of the whole ch channel protocols, of course, should be hidden by this. So you have to design a very nice API that makes it as easy as possible to extend your application. So it should be easy concepts like, okay, I want to connect those two people, we found the channel, and uh, we said something that should be very like easy to communicate. Uh, and we also think that it is very important that we can uh, make the developer inject or provide some mechanisms like logging and the networking stack and the persistence stack. So we define the persistence on abstract level, but we can, but we can then let the developer inject, say, an SQL database and use this for persistence. And then the next step is to have, this is something like the lightning node, the L&D node, so this is a full-blown um, standalone application. So the standalone application has all the logic for handling the state channel networks. But on top of this, it also has an interface by which you can communicate with the application. So then you have, for example, GFPC or JSON WebSocket on the face. It's very important that it's actually a bi-directional interface because in channels you always have this situation that you want to have callbacks to the application because you may receive a state update from the other party, so you have to ask back to the user, how do I handle this case that now an update, I, I received an update. And so in this case you want to send like callbacks back to your application. But there are also other things that you want to like hide, for example, you probably want to at least give an automated dispute handling. So the, the, you want your application to watch the chain and um, handle disputes automatically for your user, not necessarily have the user do it. But this is, I mean, it's a very, it's a very complex thing. It's a touching thing. And, um, yes, and then you also, for example, you can design it in such a way that you have on-chain callbacks to the application for certain on-chain uh, um, actions like funding of the channel. 
Um, and then this is the third level is really to have a hub server because, I mean, we didn't really talk about this much, but state channels really become awesome the moment you build networks. This is also why the Lightning Network is pretty awesome because we talk about much about this. So you want to have like some central server, hub server, and it should help other people to build virtual channels. That's what we call virtual channels to enable applications on this network. So the idea is probably that you have some DAP and the developer of this DAP wants to enable users to use this DAP. And a very efficient way to do this is you give it state channels and then you run the hub server and uh, then you let all the people connect to your hub server and then you can help them open two-party or multi-party virtual channels over your hub. And, um, Yes. So, yes. Do you think, do you think the hub server sort of should extend to the client node, or should this be a separate channel on the um, I think that you probably would have the client node and the hub server both around the library, around the core SDK, but they're probably kind of separate. Because, I mean, I think in the implementation of course, you have a lot of shared code, but I think at least that's what I'm, how I think about it, is that it is something kind of separate because I think the app server is a lot about the whole logic about handling virtual channels, helping the virtual channel work, so okay. whereas the, the, the nodes are more the end nodes than the end clients. That is it. That's at least what I can That makes sense. And yeah, so just a very brief uh, notice on, on what we uh, chose for the language, so we chose Go. Um, but a lot of people are using JavaScript. I don't think any of it is good or bad. It's just that many people are did JavaScript and we just wanted to try something new that uh, makes sense for some like standalone high performance applications. So it, so it really comes down to the use cases. For example, you can have a browser extension, that's what we saw a lot today. Um, you can have it as a library, that was the SDK I was talking about, and it can be a standalone application. So for the browser case, it makes a lot of sense to use JavaScript. The browser case makes, you think, sense to use code. And the web free tooling is actually much better for JavaScript, but uh, yeah, anyways. But for example, so we also have some IoT um, uh, IoT uh, use cases in mind, and for those IoT cases, we think it makes a lot of sense to go. Um, go is less known, so the reach is a bit slower. But um, and yes, and then it's a type of compiled uh, language as opposed to an internal language as uh, JavaScript. Um, just briefly talking about the architecture that we have internally. So we see here some layers. So at, the, at the bottom you see interfaces. I'll come to that shortly. Then you have the core protocol engine. Then you have on the left is the blockchain backend, I call it. And then you have like some generic stuff, database, logging, networking. And then on top of the blockchain backend, we have the channel application. And we designed the whole system using the version <coughs> protocol engine has no direct dependency on anything specific, like no Go Ethereum uh, dependencies, no dependencies on say Logras for logging, no dependencies on, uh, yeah, I don't know, like TCP or something, so it's really all going uh, down to the interfaces, so that means we define interfaces which say that's the way we want to use this stuff if it were to exist, and then we use it all in the whole protocol core, and then we implement all those interfaces as a blockchain backend, database logging and everything. And um, <clears throat> yes, and this is a very, very nice decoupling of this whole software so that the, the core protocol, because all the protocols you have seen today, the, the state channel protocols, are a very generic concept, right? It's an abstract concept. I think you also talked about it like Seller. They're doing blockchain agnostic messaging protocols here. And, and this is like, you can take this even further and say, okay, actually, the whole engine of this protocol, this state channel protocols, is very abstract. So for example, if you also look in the uh, parent papers, they're written in a very abstract way. So for example, the, it only has, like, it, it, it uh, models the, the blockchain as a ledger, as an account-based ledger. Okay, so this is a very abstract thing. It is not tied to any particular blockchain. And, uh, Yes, so I think that's a nice idea. Yes. Because Go is not in type, so I'm yeah. actually curious for your address. You will not use yeah, by that's, time that you will use by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually a very good question. Um, I think I have a backup slide. Uh, yeah. I think I want to go to this slide first. 
yeah, here it is. Huh. So, yeah, so when you're designing this in an abstract set of way, yeah. suddenly many, many things become quite complicated or complex. So you identify a couple of concepts, for example, addresses. You have the concept of an address, but you don't want to specify what is an address. Mm -hmm. So this is all an interface. So you only say, okay, what do you really want to do with an address? You want to check that it is equal to another address. So you give this interface an equals method, and you want to sign with your, okay, so actually you also have the concept of an account, so the secret key. Yeah, right. So you have an address and you have an account from this account, you have an address that you can sign with it, that you can verify, so you have something called signature, but it's just like an abstract signature, and then you can verify that this signature belongs to this address. And uh, yeah, so this is like one of those concepts, but you, yeah, so it makes things more complex, but it's also nice because it forces you to really find very well interfaces and really forces you to understand when you design those protocols where's exactly this layer where what separates the really the core of the protocol from implementation specifics so it's quite interesting and this is also like the, the that's the same here on the top that's like this blockchain interface that i was talking about so what do you really want to do with the blockchain you actually just want to interact with the adjudicator in those ways you want to fund and defund channels you want to watch the adjudicator, so there's this concept of watching something, but you don't want to. You don't really need to go too in, too much into detail. You just need to say, okay, watch this channel with this ID for something bad to happen, and then you can react. Um, you want to dispute or just like register states the adjudicator, and you also yeah actually the settling. Um, yes, I just want to show like a short roadmap of what we want to do. So we received a grant from the German government research team um, to, to develop this stuff. Um, we, we are going to release this uh, SDK for Ledger State channels soon. And then we want to go to virtual channels. So virtual channels, again, is this concept of having several channels that you connect together to a long virtual channel to build networks. Um, then we want to go to multi-party state channels and have a good hub server. And then we also want to do additional backends because currently, obviously, we're just concentrating on Ethereum because it's like the nicest blockchain to develop on right now. And uh, finally, we also want to do state channels and plasma chains. So instead of having a blockchain as a backend, you have a plasma chain as a backend. So this is the nice thing if you have such a abstract concept, you can really just provide a plasma backend somebody and you can just reuse all the core engine and just have a plasma backend. Okay, that's it. Thank you.
which has a really, really similar idea. And yeah, the very core uh, idea of this is that you have a payment channel and this one is always backed by an on-chain deposit. And once you have deposited uh, tokens into this payment channel, you can do as many off-chain transfers um, as you wish by exchanging balance proofs uh, with your channel partner. And those balance proofs you can just imagine as digital checks. You send something back and forth and eventually you say, yeah, I want to close my tab and then you withdraw your funds from this channel. Um, the cool thing about Raiden, um, as exactly as in Lightning, is that you can not only pay uh, the people that you have a direct channel open with, but you can also pay anybody else in the network as long as you have a connected path of payment channels uh, with the receiving party. But that comes with some challenges, and uh, that is what we will talk about in a bit. Uh, yeah, so our status is that we are live on mainnet with a limited alpha version um, since end of last year. Uh, and this version is uh, featuring all of the core functionalities that you can imagine for a payment channel network, so doing direct transfers, mediated transfers, and so on. But it's pretty limited in terms of uh, user experience, um, as well as in terms of uh, which token networks you can currently uh, use it with. Right now, it's limited to Rocky. And yeah, there you just see our current mainnet uh, is pretty, uh, pretty small still, but we hope that we can make it a bit bigger by uh, improving all the things that I will discuss now. So yeah, let's take a moment to talk about this magical thing called the user experience and why it's maybe not working out yet so well. Um, I'm trying to uh, cluster this into two different user groups because we have basically the direct end user that wants to make a payment using Raiden right now. And we have um, the target group, which is actually projects and developers that want to integrate with Raiden into their application, while the user themselves, the end user, will not really know that he's actually using Raiden by using this application. So uh, first bucket is the actual end users, and those are yeah, experiencing or might experience some challenges when they want to um, interact with the payment channel network. For example, uh, first and foremost is really about education, so uh, or also abstracting away technicalities. Um, the problem is I don't understand the logic of the payment channel network, and I also don't know how to use them. Um, the most interesting part of that is that most users don't understand the idea of a network. You can send payments to anybody. You don't need to open a channel with them. This is like the number one uh, problem that we see over time. Um, then second problem, the user interfaces are cumbersome to use and uh, people are really unfamiliar with the terminology we use. That's definitely also a problem on our side. How can we make things easier, uh, not uh, thinking so much from the technology perspective, but rather which comparisons can be used that already exist in the real world and that people are using it, for example, their banking interface or whatever. Mm. Then another problem is I definitely don't want to have, have to be online all of the time. And I totally want my payments to go through. Like, why shouldn't it go through, right? And uh, last but not least, I don't want to run a node. What is even a node and why do I have to run it? Um, so yeah, a few of those problems we're trying to tackle with the next release that's upcoming. Uh, the first two problems, I don't want to be online all of the time and I want my payments to go through. Um, they can be at least uh, improved by um, introducing services. So on top of Rain, you will have very soon a service layer. It's already now live on uh, the testnet, uh, which will come with monitoring services and with pathfinding services. Those two are like third-party services that can be provided by anybody who uh, wants to join and who will be part of the uh, Rain services registry. Um, and yeah, they will really just improve user experience. The monitoring service will basically be a watchtower. For example, if you're uh, familiar with PISA, uh, they are offering watchtower services and they will basically just look after your channel if you go offline and um, solve this problem uh, with a challenge um, or a dispute that we also talked about earlier in other talks. Um, and then the pathfinding service would, will basically just give you cheap, cheap or uh, short routes through the network so that you can be uh, more sure that your payment actually goes and goes through faster. Yeah, then a really huge problem is uh, I don't want to run a node. Um, this problem we have two solution approaches for. The first one is that we've been uh, working in the last couple of months uh, on a line client. Um, it's still work in progress, but uh, you can already test it on the test now. 
And here in the back you see how the light client is performing to transfer to a Raven full node or Raven node. Um, the light client is compatible with any Web3 enabled browser, so basically you can just use it with MetaMask. Obviously, it also has some user experience challenges right now, like you have to sign random uh, hex strings and messages, which is really cumbersome, but uh, we're getting there. And uh, the interface that you see is basically the first reference implementation of the light client SDK. The second option, oh yeah, you can try it yourself if you like. Uh, the master is always live at lightclient.rain.network. Um, if you want to try it out, it would be great to talk to us after because right now there's only one token network uh, deployed for testing. Uh, that's the TTT token and uh, if you want to mint this or if we should send you some tokens, just let us know. I also see Kelsos in the back who's our light client master. Uh, so just talk to the nice Greek man on the back um, for the light client. Option number two uh, is, yeah, we can also help people to make running nodes easier and uh, since this is a decentralized system, we also rely on somebody <laughs> for running nodes. So um, make it as easy as possible. One solution would be um, to go with that node. Raven is uh, available on that node, both testnet and mainnet packages. So if you are already running other nodes via uh, that node, it's basically just one click and you can add your Raven node. Um, the other option is help with onboarding tools. In the past, it was really uh, difficult to install Raven. Um, if you are not technical, you will not be able to do it in the past. And now uh, you are able to do it um, because we have developed something called the Raven Wizard, which basically installs and launches Raven um, for you. All you need to do is download it and double click it. And you have to have an uh, Infura project like you for this one because we assume that people who don't want to <laughs> run a node uh, and who don't, want, who don't know how to install it might probably not run their own node. But um, I assume in future it will also be possible to uh, connect them to your own Ethereum node if you have one. And yeah, then it does all of the stuff uh, that needs to be done and uh, yeah, it takes only five minutes or four seconds. Um, and that one you can install without any help needed from our side. Uh, so you can just go to our GitHub Rainbow Network slash Rain Installer or scan this QR code and it's available for Mac OS and for Linux um, for the testnet for now. But for the next release we hope to also have it for the mainnet release. Um, yeah, and then the challenges from the other side, so projects that want to integrate with Rain, they are also facing some problems. Um, the first one is again a kind of education uh, abstraction problem. Um, definitely people or projects, developers that integrate with Rain, they don't want to have to know how payment channel networks work and what we do in the back end. So uh, to use it in their product. Second problem, I definitely don't want to force my users to run a node. Uh, also connects to the last problem, like I don't want the complexity uh, to increase. I, I really don't want a worse experience for my users. It should be basically seamless. Um, then also the third problem, um, I need certain features that I don't find in the range right now, so maybe it's not suitable for me. Um, some of the problems we can solve, for example, not understanding a payment channel network. Yeah, please don't all go and learn payment channel network tech now because uh, this should be uh, abstracted away for you. We try to make it as easy as possible by offering a really high level API, which should be self-explanatory. Uh, we are also working on some good new documentation. We have a fairly, um, uh, we have a fairly long and uh, very extensive documentation already and now we're trying to develop a new doc documentation which is very easy to understand. So we basically cover both very uh, extensive and very easy to understand. Uh, we have a developer portal and we are also always available via our technical help chat uh, on GitHub. So in case you should have any problems, just give us a shot. Uh, yeah, basically don't want uh, my users to run the node. Um, that's how the back end of the Raven Night Client SDK would look like uh, when we saw the front end before. Um, yeah, they just integrate with the Raven Night Client SDK as soon as it's ready. Um, you can already try it on the test uh, I need certain features. That's not a problem at all because now that we have basically delivered all of the core components and features um, that are like the basics for payment channel network, we are super open. Uh, to incorporating whatever feature you might need. 
uh, we have already started with that. So some of the projects were requesting a general withdraw feature, which means that you can simply withdraw uh, certain parts of the funds or all parts of the funds without the need of closing a channel. This is interesting, for example, if you want to keep this channel open because you know you interact with this person a lot, but maybe you are the party always receiving funds, then you might want to cash out once in a while without closing the channel. And uh, that is now possible with the channel withdraw feature, and it takes less on-chain transactions than actually closing the whole channel, opening the channel again, which is much easier. Um, and yeah, one other example is uh, the guys from Exchange Union that just uh, launched their uh, swap between Bitcoin on Lightning and DAI on Raiden. Um, and they've been also like really closely in touch with our developers. Um, so yeah, I guess if you want to uh, have some feature implemented, just let us know. Um, we can talk it out. And then, um, yeah, moving over to uh, our business part, uh, UX is obviously not only about the front end stuff and the features, but it's really influenced by the underlying uh, system architecture. and. Uh, yeah, you will talk about that more. Okay, thank you, Francis. Thank you, Al, guys, for coming. Um, so, I'm just gonna... uh, I just want to share with you guys uh, what are some of the consequences uh, from the usability perspective of uh, the things that we have chosen design-wise, and what are the consequences of our design. Uh, so, let's just start with, like, what are we doing here? Um, we are trying to fix the file demo, right? So the, the idea that we have here is that uh, for blockchain systems, uh, you can only pick two of these three possibilities, and uh, we want to fix that. So that's why we are building say channels, where you can actually have a scalable solution that's also secure and is also decentralized. So that, that's sort of like the goal of every single presentation that we have had uh, today. And uh, from my interpretation, I think the biggest problem that we have here it boils down to communication, right? Because if we have proof of work of a proof of stake system, you actually have to share the data with uh, a lot of nodes and then uh, that's actually what uh, removes scalability from the system, the, the amount of overhead that you have in uh, communication. Okay, so what are our design goals and uh, how are we trying to actually fix this problem? So we really want to have a very high degree of decentralization. We really want our system to be completely decentralized, uh, no hubs. I mean, hubs may appear in the network if there is like highly connected uh, uh, hubs that are, are trusted by the by users, but uh, we don't want that to be part of our design. We want to have, by design, a decentralized system. Uh, we also want to have a very secure and uh, uh, very high performance system. So this is like our goals, and uh, I'm just going to try to uh, tie together like this trilemma and uh, what are the consequences from the UX perspective. Uh, what are the trade-offs that we have with this system? Uh, so one very important uh, trade-off that we have is that uh, if we want to have speed, we may have to search uh, and trustlessness. We sometimes have to, in some circumstances, we have to sacrifice speed. So uh, if everything happens on the happy case, everything is good, but it's very hard to try to explain to people uh, the sad case when things actually don't go so well, and that can happen for a few reasons. Uh, the balances of the channels in the network are actually changing all the time, right? So you never really know in a distributed network like a payment network like Raven uh, if the channels that you're trying to use actually have capacity uh, when the payment is actually going to go through them. So the payment itself may just fail for something that uh, you have no control whatsoever. It's just like the nature of the decentralized system. Uh, it could also be that uh, the internet is just bad and uh, one of the guys that are trying to communicate with just went offline. And uh, that's just the truth of the, the system, right? And uh, from a user perspective, that's very, very hard to explain why my transfer setting five minutes to fail. Because if it's, it takes six hours for a transaction to be mined on chain, we have to take that in consideration when we define the expiration of the hash time lock. And uh, that sort of uh, goes back to the user in a very unexpected and unpleasant way. Um, so just to show that in a, in a more clear fashion, uh, when we start the transfer in the, in the left side, it may be very fast to actually complete the transfer if everything is successful, the capacity is fine, every node is online, so the thing is going to be fast and the user is going to be happy. But uh, if something goes wrong, it's going to take a lot of time, and that's one of the things that we want to, to actually at least improve in the system because we cannot actually fix that. It's, it's inherent to, the, to, to how it works. Um, right now, what do we do? Yes? Well, I'm not just like 
lock funds into the path before you actually make the commitment transaction? That's exactly what we do. We first lock the funds, and then we review the secret uh, backwards, and then uh, everything is going to be unlocked, right? But, but in that case, the, the locked payment failing shouldn't cause a time right? Because like... Um, so, let me go back a little bit. So, I'm trying to lock the funds. Yeah, and right now Bob is trying to lock funds with the channel with Charlie. If Charlie is offline, Bob cannot lock the funds. Does it make sense? Right. I guess so. What I'm asking is, from a user experience perspective, what you're doing is A A is basically committing to the transaction to B yeah. when they initiate that that transfer. Yes. Right? And so they have no ability to back out of that transfer exactly. once that commitment happens. Exactly. Um, what I'm saying is, if you separate out the process of uh, you you reduce everybody's balances, then you make the transfer in two te in two separate steps. That means that you can decouple pathfinding from actually making the transaction. So if pathfinding fails, you can have like a three second timeout. Okay, pathfinding is completely decoupled. Uh, you can do pathfinding at any moment. The thing is, you do not know if the path is actually going to be successful. Right. That's what I mean. It's like you you just uh, lock the the value in the channel as part of the pathfinding itself. Yes. And then don't yes. transfer until later. Yeah, and that locking is what failure can happen. If you're trying to lock the funds and one of the nodes is not aligned, the locking didn't happen. And then uh, the nodes that actually have locked funds, they have to wait until the lock expires to get the funds back. Right? You, you, you cannot escape from that. If you try to escape from that, you're going to end up with double spending. Um, so what we can do is actually from the user perspective, we can sort of uh, hide this, but it's like there's no good solution. Uh, in the worst case, uh, it's always going to have to wait for the lock expiration. What we do right now is that uh, we introduce in the protocol ways of not having to wait for the lock to expire. So we have a thing that's called refund transfer. So if uh, the problem is that channel capacity, we just refund all the way to initiate, that transfer is complete and we can try a new one. So it's like a better user experience in that sense. Uh, another thing that we're going to work on is making them sellable transfers because refund transfers right now require twice as much capacity because you have to go, it has to be, the money has to be sent from the failing node all the way back to initiate and then we are going to have twice the collateral and we want to remove that so that we don't have to actually have twice the collateral to um, fail like certainly a transfer. Um, Another problem that we have with visibility is um, we want to make the system work and uh, one of the very important things that we have to do in the system is make sure that the network is actually going to be balanced uh, because if the network is unbalanced then payments simply are not going to go through. The uh, failure ratio is going to, going to increase so we have to employ some strategies to help the network balance itself. And uh, the way that we do that is that uh, we just uh, introduce uh, rebalance, uh, rebalancing fees. So we use the Pathfind service, uh, and uh, we through the Pathfind service we can compute which path is going to be the cheapest. And we always always try to make sure that the cheapest path is the path that's actually going to rebalance the network. The problem here is that uh, this um, um, strategy works for rebalancing the network, but it's actually very hard to explain to people how it works. Because you always have to take channels in pairs uh, from the perspective of an immediator when you're actually doing that sort of uh, uh, strategy, and that can be cumbersome to explain, right? So what we do here to try to fix this problem is that instead of trying to explain to people and uh, having them actually think and understand how the protocol works, we just try to make very good defaults. So we think about the problem and uh, we just make the decision on behalf of the user and uh, we always try to make sure that it's going to be safe, secure and it's going to be efficient for the whole network. Yes, that's uh, our solution. We're just thinking about the flows. And uh, a third problem that sometimes happens is that, uh, for instance, it's very important for us to actually know the balances of the channels. Uh, that's crucial for path time service because we need to actually choose a path that has capacity to be the transfer. The problem there is that to know the capacity, we actually have to share information about the payments that are happening. So we have to trade off a little bit of privacy to make sure that the payments are going to happen in the network. Uh, so the performance really depends on uh, giving up a little bit of privacy. So the way that we try to fix this is that we sort of allow them to lie a little bit about the capacity and then not send updates all that often so that we don't have a complete V2 
view of everything that happened, uh, but we can actually choose that uh, and use that data to find paths that can actually work. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and there, and we, that's also a very important thing. We never force our users to do something. We always have like a escape hatch or like a configuration that allows them to opt out of something that we believe that may not be good for everyone. In this case, a node can decide to not send balance updates uh, at the cost of not being used as a mediator. So he can increase his privacy, but he's not necessarily going to be used to make payments go through the network. Um, yeah, so for the next release, we're looking at different ways of trying to fix these problems. Uh, we introduced refund uh, transfers. We are going to work on the cancel of transfers. Um, and uh, we are trying to figure out how we can actually make the Pathfinder service more privacy preserving. Uh, but these are features that actually we have that, uh, even though there are, are trade offs, uh, we think they're important uh, because they're going to help making sure that uh, our payments actually go through and the user is going to have just a better experience by not having to go through all these um, problems that can happen. And, uh, yeah, so with that, I just want to say that uh, we're pretty much uh, cutting the release in a few weeks uh, that's going to have the monitoring service and it's going to have the pathfind service so uh, we expect uh, the uh, successful rate of transfers to increase and uh, people don't have to run the nodes full time anymore so please try it out uh, I would say that we are pretty much uh, production ready and uh, yeah, everyone should uh, try it out and if you have questions I uh, just uh, reach us out in the in the, the medium channel, and we are happy to help you all out. Thank you.